JD, unmute. Welcome, everybody. I'm JD Nolan. Uh, I'm the chair of the uh, Hell's Kitchen Clinton Land Use Committee of Manhattan Community Board 4. This is our regular monthly meeting. As you know, we're doing it on Zoom still, and it's going to be recorded on YouTube. Uh, and uh, we have an agenda which you can view, but I'll give you a preview. We have two items. The first item is from the Department of City Planning, ZFA, zoning for uh, something, zoning for accessibility, uh, a, a good program they want to present to us. The second thing is going to be a presentation from the Slaughterhouse folks, and we've heard of you and we welcome you back. And then we'll have a few more items to discuss. As you know, we have a presentation, the committee asks questions, makes comments, we go back and forth. The public may be with us and Please, if you are joining us, uh, you're welcome to ask questions. Janine Pretente, our community associate, runs this show. So she will put you on and tell you what to do and how to mute and unmute. Uh, so we're gonna have a, an important uh, productive meeting tonight. Uh, I wanna welcome Betty McIntosh. Betty is the co-chair of the Chelsea Land Use Committee. After the uh, discussion from city planning, it will go to the Chelsea uh, Land Use Committee for further discussion. So since we already have Paul Devlin, who's co-chair of the Chelsea Land Use Committee, I thought it was appropriate to have Betty with us. She's the other co-chair and she agreed to write any letters that have uh, come out of it. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a bonus for joining the uh, Hell's Kitchen Land Use Committee. Uh, I see Bob Benfado and Brian Weber, uh, James Wallace, uh, Welcome everybody here. And uh, do we have a city planning folks here? Um, I'm looking. Nabila. Oh, here you are. You're right in the middle. I've missed you, Nabila. Welcome. Welcome. Very good to have you here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to present. And if you don't mind, you'll take some questions after that. Yep. So Great. welcome. Welcome, DCP. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all again. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nabila Malik, and I'm the planner for CB4 at the Department of City Planning. Um, and I'll ask Janine if you wouldn't mind pulling up our presentation. Um, we are um, going to be presenting Zoning for Accessibility. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, Chris Lee from the Department of City Planning and Munson Park from the MTA. So Chris and Munson will go through a brief overview of the zoning text amendment that aims to improve ADA access throughout the city. And while we have tailored this presentation to Community Board 4 by providing relevant maps and images and things, I do want to emphasize that this is a citywide proposal um, and we want you to be fully informed since you will be commenting on the proposal as a whole. So therefore this presentation is comprehensive and you may see aspects of it that don't necessarily apply here, but are important for you to understand when drafting a resolution. Um, and like I said, we'll stay for questions following the presentation and I'll provide links to additional resources on our website. And we can also follow up on any questions that are not answered today. Um, official recommendations from all 59 community boards, borough boards and borough presidents are requested by June 14th. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to, to Chris to begin and Munson to begin the presentation. Um, well, thank you. Um, we can actually move to the, the next slide. And good evening, everyone. My name is Moonsun Park. I am with the MTA. At the MTA, I am with the Transit Oriented Development Group. And thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, as Nabila mentioned, the MTA, uh, City Planning, and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities are proposing a citywide zoning text amendment to provide more opportunities for the MTA to collaborate with developers to get to system-wide accessibility more quickly. So our proposal includes two components. The first component is a system-wide 
transit easement requirement. The second component is an expansion of a transit improvement bonus to the highest density areas in the city. Next slide, please. So with the subway system over 100 years old and most stations built before 1950, making our system accessible is very challenging. And while the MTA has made progress in increasing accessibility, including 11 new uh, ADA stations last year alone, uh, we admittedly still have a long way to go. Uh, currently 136 out of the 493 subway and Staten Island railway stations are accessible, uh, which comes out to uh, about 28% of all stations. Uh, we have a slightly better track record with the commuter rail stations in the city. Um, 25 out of the 39 commuter rail stations in the city limits are accessible. Um, I do wanna mention that uh, this proposal uh, focuses on uh, vertical accessibility, but when we do talk about um, a station accessibility, there are many, many components to making a station fully accessible. But this, but this proposal helps us with the hardest component, the hardest piece, which is um, vertical accessibility. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so with uh, with less than a third of our subway stations accessible, it makes navigating our subway system extremely difficult for those who require an accessible station. This affects people with ambulatory disabilities, seniors, parents and guardians with young children, people with temporary injuries, and even someone who just needs to take an elevator on a certain day because they have a very large package, for example. Uh, so. Someone who requires an accessible station, uh, especially um, uh, people with ambulatory disabilities, they um, on a regular basis often have to take a circuitous trip, which adds many more minutes to their ride than it actually should. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, over half a million of our residents in New York City have an ambulatory disability. Uh, and over a quarter of New Yorkers are potentially impacted by the lack of accessible stations. And, and with an aging population, the need for system-wide accessibility becomes more imperative than ever. Um, the percentage of, of seniors um, in New York City is actually growing at a faster rate than the population as a whole. Next slide, please. Um, but as I mentioned, we are making progress, the MTA is making progress, and we are fully committed to system-wide accessibility. Our current capital plan dedicates more than $5 billion towards making 77 more uh, New York City transit and commuter rail stations accessible within New York City. And when that capital plan is complete, 43% uh, of our subway stations will be fully accessible and a subway rider will not be more than two stations away from an accessible station in all five boroughs. Um, but we do need more tools in our toolbox to help us get to system-wide accessibility, to get us beyond that 43% um, number um, in five years, and, and zoning for accessibility is such a tool. I, I do wanna add that uh, this um, proposal is not intended to replace any of our capital commitments, but only supplement uh, our capital program. Next slide, please. So, and there are many reasons why making our decades old stations accessible uh, so challenging. Uh, when the stations were built, they were not designed with a consideration for accessibility uh, decades ago. So finding the space for elevators um, on narrow platforms inside the uh, turnstile areas is, is very, very difficult. Um, um, and then outside of our stations, finding space on the congested and narrow sidewalks um, leaves little options for siting an elevator. And, and then these are just the visible constraints. Um, 
whether we're trying to place an elevator on a sidewalk or inside the station, um, we have to often relocate underground utilities or utilities within the station, which significantly adds time and money to that process. And so just as an example, getting an easement within a building and moving elevators off the sidewalk is an example of how this particular proposal will not only help get to system-wide accessibility faster, but also will help alleviate um, the overall sidewalk and streetscape environment. So I, um, I will now uh, turn the presentation over to Chris Lee at City Planning, who will explain the details of zoning for accessibility. Thanks, Thank Monson, Thank and you, hi, Mark. everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Lee from the Department of City Planning, and I'm with the Zoning Division. And as Munson just described, elevator construction can be quite challenging and to help better coordinate and align new developments with transit station needs. We have transit related zoning provisions in place today to help alleviate some of these burdens. Up to date, they have supported the actual delivery of transit improvements and have helped ensure that opportunities for coordinating developments and station improvements are evaluated and realized. These tools have also resulted in better station design and improved sidewalk environments outside resulting from station entrances being located off the sidewalk. Existing transit related zoning provisions generally consist of easement requirements and station improvement bonuses, which I will quickly summarize in the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. Sorry, can we go to the next slide again? Thank you. Easement provisions address the challenges of locating new station entrances and other transit amenities. An easement, which is a legal right to use another's land for a specific purpose, have tradi traditionally been used to provide space for new station entrances, passageways, or ancillary facilities that support subway lines such as emergency egress or ventilation structures. However, in the zoning resolution today, these provisions have very limited coverage and only apply in very few areas in the city, such as along 2nd Avenue for the 2nd Avenue subway line, and most recently in the special Inwood district. What this means is that zoning uh, that the zoning resolution does not currently provide a system wide approach for facilitating transit easements on development sites around transit stations. As a result of these limitations, there have been missed opportunities for MTA to locate ADA access at optimal locations on development sites next to a, next to a station, such as this development site that is adjacent to the 14th Street station on 6th Avenue. Next slide, please. The zoning resolution also contains transit bonus mechanisms to support the creation of transit improvements. In the densest commercial districts in the city, we've incentivized developers to provide um, the space and to construct station improvements, including ADA access through floor area bonuses that provide additional development rights. As with easement provisions, transit bonus mechanism are also limited to a handful of areas in or near our central business districts. Within this limited geography, only sites next to subway stations can take advantage of the standard subway improvement bonus program. Additionally, the current process associated with obtaining a transit bonus can be quite cumbersome, adding time and risk to the development schedule. All of these factors have limited the number of subway bonus applications we've seen to date. Next slide. So to build on the effectiveness of these provisions and address the limitations that I just mentioned, we are proposing zoning for accessibility, which is a citywide zoning text amendment that would create a, um, more opportunities for accessibility throughout the transit system. Next slide. To support the long-term planning needs of mass transit stations and facilitate transit station upgrades beyond the limited coverage of today's transit-related provisions, ZFA proposes to expand the easement requirement system-wide to most station-adjacent sites, provide zoning flexibility on sites where easements are provided to offset potential burdens of this requirement on development feasibility, and finally increase participation in the transit bonus program by increasing its applicability to other high-density areas in the city. Next slide. So the first component of the proposal is a system-wide easement requirement that would assist MTA and other transit agencies with identifying opportunities for locating future station access points and other station facilities. 94% of MTA stations in the city would be covered by this provision. The provision would, co uh, would cover all New York City transit stations, Staten Island, Metro North and Long Island Railroad stations, as well as PATH stations. 
As part of this requirement, all developments and enlargements on zoning lots within 50 feet of mass transit stations and in applicable zoning districts would need to file an application with the MTA and the chairperson of the City Planning Commission to determine whether an easement on the zoning lot is needed to help facilitate station access improvements in the future. Applicable districts include residence districts that support multifamily apartment buildings, which are generally more compatible with transit station entrances and other transit related uses. These districts include R5 with the commercial overlay, R5D districts, and districts with higher density levels. Medium and high density commercial and all manufacturing districts would also be subject to the requirement as developments in such districts are more easily able to accommodate station entrances. Next slide. And just to clarify, this first component of the proposal is a requirement for creating easements, uh, which is a, a space reserved on a development site that will be improved in the future by the MTA for station access. So in Community District 4, all stations would be covered by the easement requirement, including all subway and commuter rail. The green shaded area is where any development or any enlargement involving ground floor construction would need to obtain a certification prior to any application for any excavation permit, foundation permit, new building permit, or alteration permit. Next slide. The transit agency, in consultation with the developer and the chairperson of the City Planning Commission, would determine the type of easement for future station upgrades. Depending on the needs of the individual station, transit easements could vary in shape and size. The vertical volume of an easement could occupy several floors depending on the elevation of the station. So underground subway stations could occupy multiple levels below grade, whereas elevated transit stations could take up a number of floors above grade. The horizontal footprint of an easement could also vary depending on the type of access that is needed. An elevator could take up less space, whereas a new station entrance that requires a staircase, elevator, turnstiles could require a larger easement volume. There are also different types of easements depending on whether it is intended to provide a future station access point or in other instances, substations, which typically weren't larger volumes in the cellar level of a development site. Next slide. Easement volumes can vary in shape and size and can affect development sites in a number of ways. The easement itself can take up floor space on a site and reduce available floor area of the development itself the shape and size of an easement can also occupy a large amount of space within a development's building envelope. This not only affects the direct area that is occupied by the easement, but also has implications for construction feasibility around such area. Easements can also restrict available space to provide ground floor uses and parking spaces, and depending on the type of development, may create compatibility issues with more sensitive uses, such as apartment units and other residential uses. So in order to facilitate the provision of easements, targeted relief from certain zoning limits would be provided to minimize potential challenges for construction on a site subject to the proposed requirement. There are five general categories of provisions being proposed. They include floor area and open space provisions, height and setback modifications, parking relief, which does not apply in the Manhattan core, use allowances, and streetscape provisions. Next slide. The set of proposed floor area and open space relief is intended to allow developments to be constructed without losing their permitted buildable floor area due to an easement and to provide greater flexibility for locating easements and station connections in the future. To ensure that the permitted floor space on site is not reduced as a result of the easement, floor area contained within any easement volume would be excluded from zoning floor area. To provide flexibility for designating easement areas at an optimal location on a site, and to ensure that any future vertical circulation elements within easements can connect appropriately to below or above grade stations, transit easements would also be treated as permitted obstructions. Law coverage would also be increased in certain districts to allow easements to be integrated more easily within buildings. Next slide. The proposed height modifications would provide targeted building envelope flexibility in districts governed by maximum building height limits to facilitate the provision of easements and permitted floor area. To enable developable floor space to be accommodated elsewhere around the easement volume, sites that provide an easement would be able to increase their maximum height by 10 feet. And just as a side note, in R7 districts and above, maximum heights would be increased by 20 feet for developments that provide an easement serving in elevated stations. Since uh, Community District 4 doesn't have any elevated stations, 20 feet would not apply here. Street wall flexibility would also be provided within 15 feet of an easement area to provide greater flexibility in articula articulating street walls around such volumes. 
Next slide. Use allowances are also proposed to activate spaces around future station entrances that will enhance the surrounding environment. In some instances, an easement may not be improved immediately with new station entrance. And so to activate these vacant spaces, the proposed modifications would allow transit easements to be temporarily occupied by any permitted uses except residential use until such volume is needed by the transit agency. In residence districts, local retail uses would also be permitted as a temporary use. To promote complementary uses around easement areas and enhance sidewalk environments where future station entrances uh, may be located, local retail uses would be permitted within 30 feet around an easement in residence districts. Next slide. <clears throat> Modifications to streetscape requirements would be provided to ensure that rules pertaining to the ground floor or other elements affecting street design do not conflict with station design requirements. Easement areas would therefore be excluded from general streetscape provisions, which include ground floor use regulations, transparency provisions, and planting requirements applicable in lower density districts or pursuant to quality housing requirements. The proposed streetscape provisions would also ensure that developments are built appropriately around easement areas and future station entrances. To ensure a safe distance between vehicular movement resulting from access through off street parking spaces and transit users entering and leaving station entrances within designated easement areas, curb cuts would be restricted within 30 feet of an easement. Next slide. In addition to the proposed regulations, additional relief may be needed to address unique site conditions that may create challenges for providing an easement. In other situations, certain developers may want to provide complementary circulation space around the easement in the form of additional open space that may warrant further modifications. To allow for additional flexibility, further use bulk parking loading and streetscape modifications would be available pursuant to discretionary review and approval. Depending on the amount of relief that is requested, modifications would either be subject to an authorization that would allow a height increase of up to 25% or through a special permit if more relief is needed. Next slide. And while the easement requirement only applies to developments and enlargements on sites with a lot area of at least 5,000 square feet in applicable zoning districts, easements may also be provided voluntar voluntarily on other sites. For such sites where an easement is provided in the same applicable zoning districts, zoning relief would apply. So specifically on small sites with a lot area of less than 5,000 square feet, the same set of relief applicable to required sites would apply to developments and enlargements providing an easement. On sites with an existing building that is being converted, targeted relief would be provided to facilitate the provision of an easement area within an existing building. In other instances, instead of a transit easement, the transit agency may need additional sidewalk space or clear path around an existing or future station entrance. Where a clear path is provided, street wall flexibility would apply to allow street walls to be located beyond the permitted distance from the street line or street walls of adjacent buildings. Next slide. The second component of the proposal is an expanded transit bonus program that would be optional for sites that are approximate to a mass transit station. Today's subway bonus mechanism grants a floor area bonus of up to 20% for a significant station improvement. The current mechanism, however, only applies to station adjacent sites in the highest density commercial districts in the city. Because of the limited applicability of this program and lengthy application review process needed to obtain such floor area bonus, only a handful of station improvements have been provided through this tool to this day. Next slide. So to address the limitations of today's subway bonus mechanism, the proposed transit bonus program would continue to grant a floor area bonus of up to 20% of the maximum floor area ratio for developments and enlargements that construct station improvements, but expand the geography of areas where a transit bonus may be used um, to other high density areas. Such floor area bonus would be subject to a simplified discretionary review and approval process in the form of an authorization by the City Planning Commission. Next slide. The new bonus program would expand the applicability of the existing subway bonus program to other high density areas and key business districts in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. The proposed bonus would expand the geography to other high density areas, including all R9 and R10 districts in the city, their commercial equivalent and M16 districts. The new transit bonus 
would also allow sites that are within 500 feet of a station to participate in the program in exchange for an off-site improvement that would be constructed at a station that is not immediately adjacent to the site. Within central business districts in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens, such off-site improvements may be provided within a distance of 1,500 feet from the development site. So this feature of the new bonus program to allow both on-site and off-site improvements would incentivize a greater number of developments to provide station improvements. Next slide, please. So as shown on this map, all stations would be covered by the proposed bonus program along 8th Avenue, 7th Avenue, and 6th Avenue. The purple area on this map shows the 1,500 foot radius, which indicates applicability within central business district special purpose districts. These include Hudson Yards, Garden Center, and portions of East Midtown. The orange area indicates the area of applicability within 500 feet of a mass transit station. So in the purple and orange shaded areas, sites are able to utilize the transit bonus for the construction of station improvements. Next slide. In order for a floor area bonus to be authorized, the owner of the development site would have to construct a significant station improvement. Such improvements could vary and include a single or variety of station upgrades. Where stations are inaccessible, ADA upgrades would be prioritized. In the case, um, um, sorry, uh, the bonus floor area could only be occupied only after the MTA or the transit agency determines that such improvements are usable by the public. Next slide. And the findings listed here are based on the current subway bonus special permit and look at the benefits of the proposed improvement to the general public. As part of the City Planning Commission's considerations, improvements would be evaluated to determine if the amount of floor area to be authorized is commensurate with the benefits that such improvements could provide to the station. In addition, the Commission would have to find that the improvements would result in significant enhancements to station accessibility, capacity, and overall design. Next slide. And for developments and enlargements providing a transit improvement, modifications to other zoning provisions would be available pursuant to additional discretionary review and approval. Depending on the amount of relief that is necessary, modifications may either be subject to an authorization that would allow a height increase of up to 25% or through a special permit if further height relief is needed. Other relief that would be made available through discretionary review and approval include modifications to use, parking, loading, and streetscape requirements. Modifications pursuant to the authorization or special permit would be subject to specific findings. So in summary, the greater coverage of the expanded transit bonus program, as well as the simplifi simplification of the application process for most sites seeking a bonus would result in additional transit improvements and upgrades for ADA access. Next slide. Janine, the uh, computer's logging off. I can, I can see her screen right now. I'm, I can still see. I, 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 yeah, is it, is it working? Because I'm, I'm not having any issues. No, I'm, at least I'm not no. seeing it either. <clears throat> so this is a general summary slide. Um, Zoning for Accessibility proposes a chair certification. That would be a requirement for sites that are within 50 feet of a mass transit station and in applicable zoning districts. This certification, and, and this is not to be confused with the bonus, is intended to facilitate the siting of easements on transit adjacent sites for the MTA to construct new access points at a later time. Where easements are needed, targeted relief from certain zoning limits would be provided in order to minimize potential challenges for construction on a site subject to this requirement. The proposal also includes an expanded transit bonus program in the form of an authorization for developments that are interested in constructing actual improvements. Um, this, this is completely optional and it, it would continue to grant a floor area bonus of up to 20% of the maximum floor area ratio for developments and enlargements that construct station improvements. Um, but it would also expand the geography of, of areas where transit bonus may be used. And finally, for both uh, easement and bonus sites, additional modifications to other zoning provisions would be available pursuant to additional discretionary review and approval. Uh, next slide, please.
And, and so this is uh, where we are right now with the proposal. The application was referred out last month by the commission and we are currently in public review. Um, we are in the process of presenting this application to all 59 community boards as this text is citywide and we welcome your comments, feedbacks and recommendations. Um, and the next steps are that a public hearing will be held at the commission followed by a commission vote sometime after and the application will move on to city council for potential adoption in the fall. And that is it with the presentation and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Uh, Chris, thank you. And, and Munson, thank you so much for that presentation. I, I think there's gonna be a lot of questions. This is a pretty complex thing uh, for me to, to, to grasp. Uh, Munson, I just ask when you say vertical, vertical, you, you mean elevators, uh, that's what that means? Yes. Uh, nothing else but elevators, no escalators, just elevators. Oh, you. No, um, so the way the ADA law works is if you're going to make an improvement to a station, an access improvement or a circulation improvement, that station net has to um, be, if it's not an accessible station, then the first improvement must be accessibility. And then you can make other improvements in tandem with it, but it has to um, have ADA access first if it's not an accessible station. Okay, thank you. And and Chris, I, I missed something, but you said uh, an alteration, an alteration can trigger this, the alteration of a building. So, so the sorry, um, just just to clarify, yeah. any um, site within an applicable zoning district, and that generally includes uh, residence districts that support multifamily dwelling units, as well as most commercial and manufacturing districts sites in those districts that are looking to develop something new or to enlarge their existing building, uh, but that enlargement also involves some kind of construction on the ground floor would trigger this requirement. And so what happens is that, what would happen if this text gets approved is that um, any site that, that would like some kind of building permit and um, uh, goes to the DOB will be flagged for this specific requirement that is the easement requirement. Okay, Chris, and one more question, clarification for me. The 25, the 20 percent, then another 25 percent possible if the commissioner commission grants it. Is that 25 percent on top of the 20 percent or is okay. that? <clears throat> Sorry, I should have made this a little more clear. So the 20 percent is for the optional bonus program. Um, and, and that site would have to construct and deliver an actual station improvement. When I say 25%, that is referring to additional zoning height relief. Um, that is not the FAR increase um, pursuant to the bonus program. First one is bulk JD, the second one is height. That's gotcha. right. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm sure there are no questions. Uh, Betty can write the letter, we're all, we're all set. Okay, who who wants to, who wants to ask something? Uh, the man over there, Joe. Yeah. So, a <clears throat> couple of questions and uh, some broad strokes. First of all, the easement stuff sounds really good because obviously there's a lot of missed opportunities, and you can reserve an easement and it gets done later. So we have an easement, for example, in a related building on 42nd Street, Mima, for a future station that may or may not be built on 41st and 10th, and that's in their reserve part of Hudson Yard zoning. We're pretty familiar with that. Why, one it's a very simple question, why would you include the 34th Street Hudson Yards zoning uh, station on your map, which is a fully ADA accessible station at all as part of this discussion? Um, that's, that's a very good question. Um, again, this is a citywide application that will be, um, that, 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 that could be adopted and uh, enshrined in the zoning resolution in the future um, if this newly constructed station is no longer a newly constructed station in, in, in the future and the MTA uh, needs uh, additional space for whatever reason, um, that this easement would provide some kind of level of coordination between the development. So, and So that is solely for the easement, nothing to do with the bonuses. The, so the, the Hudson Yard station is covered under the uh, Hudson Yards uh, special district and was recently um, was recently constructed, so no. I, I know, but I'm asking again, it is only for the easement provisions going forward for some future or changed use. It has nothing to do with an, an additional layer of bonus at that location. 
Um, if if a site is within a thousand five hundred feet from the Hudson Yards station, then it, it it could take advantage of the bonus program. If in the future again, if there is additional needs for some type of improvement at that okay. specific so state. let let's start out with that from a straight mm -hmm. political point of view. Hudson Yards in those four corners has the densest zoning in the city of New York. It is an absolute misstep to even consider putting a provision in that says in the future, you could increase the densest zoning in the city of New York for that station. Mm -hmm. I find that like from having dealt with Hudson Yards for over 15 or 16 years now, that's sort of insulting, Chris. And please make sure that any bonus provision gets removed because our community swallowed again, the densest bonus in the city in order to deal with broader citywide improvements. So please, that's a tick box, right? Um, Can I, um, yeah. if, 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 I, if I could comment, um, yeah. um, as, as this is one of the newest stations, um, so it is very unlikely, um, even though sometime in the future, it may not be one of the newest stations, um, but, it is unlikely that uh, because the bonus provision is for access and circulation, that a new access and circulation point would be added. So um, because it, the text amendment is, is a citywide text amendment, it just, it applies things universally, you know, if it falls under certain, you know, criteria. So if, if, if there were a developer within 1500 feet and said, I want a bonus and the station that is within 1500 feet of us of my site is the Hudson Yard station. It's not like they get that bonus automatically. You know, we have to say there is an, a need for an improvement and you know, it's a new station. I, I, I just, I, it would be. Okay. May I introduce you to related companies. Water moves through rock in the development process in New York city. There is no reason to put even the possible, a citywide text amendment can be tailored to be applied to certain districts and not others, depending upon their underlying zoning text. And we will recommend to you that that absolutely should have nothing to do with the bonus provision. Easements, of course, is that changes and how things are done or whatever makes perfect sense, right? But the idea, of, and these are huge zoning lots that are half blocks. So I just flagged that when I did my reading as one item, just leave it at that so you can, you can hear it, okay? The next question I have for you is, how does the bonus provisions work in the Clinton Special Zoning District? Because historically, we have only had one bonus. That bonus is for inclusionary housing. We originally from 1973 to 1992 had two bonuses, one for open space, one for affordable housing. Until that bonus, second open space was removed, we didn't get affordable housing production. Is, it, is my reading correct of the proposed text that in the perimeter areas along West 42nd and 8th Avenue, if there were a bonus, you could have either inclusionary or accessibility. So the so the transit bonus program is designed to work with inclusionary housing bonus. So a development site that is also um, within the inclusionary housing designated areas, or uh, in the case of R10 districts where they can um, they can participate in the R10 program, uh, they would have the option to either go for inclusionary housing uh, bonus, which is an as of right, um, which is an as of right bonus. It's, it's not subject to any sort of discretionary review or approval, or they're able to um, go with uh, the transit bonus, but the transit bonus is a discretionary, uh, has a discretionary review process. And the third option is they would also be able to utilize both the inclusionary housing, which is again, as of right, and the transit bonus. Right, so you may not be aware when the time score, when the, uh, um, the theater district was rezoned, specifically there was a small stretch of 8th Avenue between 42nd and 45th streets on the west side of 8th Avenue, and the theater sub-district theater bonus was moved overlaid on top of the inclusionary bonus on 8th Avenue. In that discussion, in that negotiation, we, our community negotiated and got a specific provision saying inclusionary is first and that bonus is second. We'd like to note in all of these things, we cannot have an option. We have learned over a 35 year period when you have an option, someone will take something in some way which is easier. So for example, 
there may be a business develops a provision that you could not do improvements, but pay into a fund or do whatever you have to do. And it's an authorization, which means it's not public, fully public, you know, review. So I think it's important as we move ahead to deal with a huge social need and a huge need for the MTA, we respect specific agreements that have been made from special zoning districts, especially, because those are flashpoints. So I think our board can consider support something that's a, that would say you can have something on top of the um, a bonus and it's either Midtown or a theater district. But again, I want to say these are conflicting uh, citywide goals. There's a specific decision was made that add these additional blocks in in order to get more uh, development rights to go uh, to be, be able to be sold in the theater district. Now you're saying that you could actually not do any inclusionary or do any affordable housing or any theater district bonuses, but only do the accessibility. I think you have to think through the nuances of existing special zoning districts such as ours. Really seriously important to look at on how to do something like this. Thank um, you, Jay. Joe, we got some, can we come back to you? I want to get- Sure, absolutely, Jay. A bunch of people will come back to you. Leslie, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, JD. Uh, Mr. Lee or uh, Ms. Park, uh, question I have is, given that the open restaurant program is now going to be permanent, how does this fit and factor into uh, your program for the uh, disabled, whether it be subway or bus? Um, again, this, this program is designed to um, uh, improve subway stations and is, is really designed to help um, coordinate any type of future improvements that could take place at or around uh, subway station entrances. So they're, they're really kind of um, separate proposals. But would you be uh, monitoring whether or not restaurants have established uh, blocking areas to egress or ingress to those stations? How would that be monitored to make sure there's compliance? Um, I, I would like Moonsun to answer this question, perhaps. Um, well, I would have to get back to you about um, how the 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 op this open restaurants um, uh, program. I'm sorry, I don't know the full name of it. It's the curbside if, dining. Yeah, right. If the what happens if it conflicts with certain entrances? I'm not sure of the answer to that, and I I, I would you know I would have to confer and then and then get back to the committee about that specific question. It, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. So Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here and just say that the, the citywide open restaurants proposal um, is still currently being developed. And one of the things that is being considered are, you know, pedestrian circulation um, uh, sort of regulations and um, various street constraints and sidewalk constraints. So, so something like that, I think your question will be more addressed through that proposal because what ZFA is trying to do is really, um, you know, part of the easement requirement is to alleviate that sidewalk congestion and, and put access areas to subways into uh, development. So um, I think that, that your question, which is a really important one about the circulation will, will be more relevant and come up more during the open restaurants proposal. Thank you, Nabella. Thank you. Good question, Wesley. Uh, I think James is next and then Christine, James. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanna thank uh, the presenters for giving us such a detailed uh, insight into the goals of this program. Um, I, I guess first, I just want to echo what Joe said. It was my first question that came to my mind is how does this affect the special districts? And just to piggyback on what Joe said, you know, it seems to me that if these are cumulative, it's like stacking coupons. Like there comes a point where you're, you're, you're giving away kind of too much. And, and if one building on a block can stack an inclusion hearing housing bonus and an ADA compliant uh, uh, MTA stop, 
you're going to change the character of that neighborhood. And that's what later developers use to get further exceptions. So it, I, I know that that's not the intent, but that's kind of the point is that there might be unintended consequences of creating these incentives for developers. So that's just my piggyback on Joe's point. My, my, I have a couple quick questions. One, and it, and it was implied, but I just want to make sure it's clearly stated. Who bears the cost of the actual uh, ADA compliant improvements to stations? I'm assuming it's a developer, but I just want to hear that be stated clearly. Yes, for the bonus, the, the yeah. developer will be paying and building the improvement. Yeah, and how did this plan come to the number of, of I believe it was 20% in some cases and 25%. I, I apologize if I'm misremembering, but how, how was that number determined? So 20% is for the FAR bonus. Um, and that's um, generally the case for um, other citywide you know, FAR bonus mechanisms. It's, it's, it's very standard. Um, as for the 25% height increase, that has more to do with if you are a bonus site and you want additional height relief, you have to go through this authorization, another authorization process. Um, how much height, additional height do you need to fit? In districts where there's a height limit? Yes. That's what you didn't say before. Yes. So 25% of a height increase where there is a maximum building height limit. So again, so, the Thank, thank you, Chris. And the, the reason I asked the question is, you know, I, I haven't run the numbers. Uh, I don't know what the numbers look like, but I'm not sure if that's a fair exchange of value uh, for something that's going to have a permanent impact on, on a neighborhood. But, you know, we, we can, I will defer, actually, I would love, Joe, if you would follow up on that. But it just seems like you, taking a number because it's been used before doesn't indicate to me that any analysis has been done as to why the number is appropriate for this program. Um, the last question I have, and it's more kind of a, a, I'm concerned, right? We're looking at 23, I think it was percent ADA accessible throughout the city of New York. You know, we have a member who just, you know, finished their stint on the community board, a very distinguished stint, Martin Treat, who has accessibility challenges. And you're telling me that he's gonna wait five years for a 15% improvement where is the sense of urgency? You know, the people who need accessible uh, MTA stops are exactly the people who have ADA compliance challenges and that's why the ADA was passed. And the idea that in five years, we're only gonna get another 15% to me is a little, it, it's a little ludicrous. It, it, it lacks a sense of urgency. I wanna hear a plan for getting to 100%, not a 15% marginal increase. It's a little, it's a little disingenuous. And then to sit here and discuss, you know, well, let's hand it off to to developers. Which, by the way, I appreciate the creativity. I think it's it's not a bad idea, but you know, we need more action by the MTA and and by the politicos. I know that clearly you have you have budgetary limitations, but still, there are actual people who are being affected, and and, and you know, shifting the burden to developers to me is, is not indicating to me that the MTA is taking responsibility in an aggressive way to getting to 100% compliance. That's all I have. Thank you, James. Maybe next month, Novella, you come back with a better plan, we hope. Could, can, can I, I would love to hear uh, Ms. Park respond to that, please. Um, well, I don't disagree that um, trying to get to system-wide accessibility um, is, is a goal. I mean, it's an important goal, and I wish we could get there in five years. Um, but um, it is it is a hard process. Um, um, we do have some very challenging stations, um, and and that's why getting these easements, for example, is one of the reasons. It will be one of the ways to help us get to that faster because it will help us avoid certain costs and certain complexities, and and you know. <clears throat> Um, I wish we had more resources, but um, we're competing with a lot of other, um, you know, requirements. So um, I don't disagree with you, but uh, I think that our proposal in front of you is to help us get there faster. Thank you, Martin. 
Uh, thank you, James. Uh, I'm going to welcome Christine uh, Berté. She's not a member of this committee, but she is the co-chair of the Transportation Committee. So I'm going to let her on if she's there with us. Christine, are you with us? Janine, do you know if Christine's there? Yes, that's it. I oh, there you are. Just move me over. Welcome, Christine. Thank you, JD, and good presentation. So I have three comments, questions slash comments. One is, uh, uh, when you showed the um, uh, criteria for the special permit, one of the things, one was to create significant improvement on uh, accessibility and capacity. But the second one was to have the word beautification. And what I'm concerned about here is, is you know, mission creep of uh, somebody installing a nice uh, screen in a station and saying, okay, uh, that's it. I deserve an improve, uh, a bonus. So how do we make sure that that second statement doesn't get abused? And, uh, you know, just when Governor Cuomo decide that he want to redesign the aesthetic of our station that covers it, right? Which was not such a great uh, initiative. So I'd like an answer to that. Uh, beautification is, is, is not uh, among the improvements um, that- it was, was in the text, it was in the text that you showed, that Chris showed in the special permit. So, Gen generally speaking, I mean, the traditional, and, and this is really an expansion of the existing subway bonus special permit. And traditionally, the improvements have been accessibility, capacity enhancing circulation improvements, and they have to be significant. And we're not deviating from those requirements. Um, but there, there, there have been historically other types of improvements that have been part of the package. The, you know, beautification environmental improvements of the stations themselves have not individually or, or singly been um, justified for that amount of floor area bonus. And they've uh, traditionally in, in the past applications been part of a larger package of improvements, which generally include so, uh, capacity enhancing. So I think the language in the text need to be changed. Mm -hmm. So it says that the second the second condition cannot stand by itself. And it needs to be in addition to a major improvement because I think the text was a little uh, concerning. Was that in the text, was only text or just in the presentation, Christine? In, in, in that page where Chris presented the text ah, for the uh, permit, right? So one of the condition, but it didn't say and, it said or. You know, and I think we need a very strong and so we don't have again, you know. Uh, so that's my first comment. The second thing is the construction. Um, that same Martin Treat was re reminding me how the Zeckendorf Tower were given some special consideration for building elevators. And those elevators didn't work for 20 years. And so the question is here, who is going to construct those improvements to what level of quality and how can we be sure that they are going to be, uh, you know, of, of the highest quality necessary and that we don't give away 25% of highs in exchange of something that doesn't work. I can answer that. Um, in overtime, um, our current development agreement actually addresses those very concerns that you're raising. So if a developer constructs an elevator today um, and pays for that elevator um, and it's within their property, um, our current agreements with the developer specifically outlines their obligations for maintenance and what happens if they don't meet certain obligations. So for example, they have to meet or exceed um, the availability rate of New York City transit elevators in the system. Right now it's 96.5%. In addition, they have to provide letters of credit to the MTA 
so that in the event that, um, uh, so that we can self-help and respond and fix those elevators if the developer for whatever reason is not responding in the amount of time that they are supposed to. So if an elevator has an issue, um, they are required to respond within two hours. We're also, the MTA is now a third party on the elevator service contracts so that we, are, we have the ability to also um, call and, and reach out to the uh, service contractor. But again, uh, we have, um, the, the developer is required to put up a letter of credit uh, so that we can self-help as well yeah. and respond to those issues. So Munjun, that's very helpful, but I was going be before that. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, there, do they have a, a standards to follow to comply with MTA standards? Mm -hmm. And uh, is the uh, COO subject to the inspection of the MTA? Um, so, so if the elevator is built within the uh, developer's building, that elevator is designed to uh, New York City DOB, uh, New York City code, because it's actually within the developer's building. If the developer is, all, is building an elevator inside of our station, for example, off the developer site, it could be, for example, an elevator um, going down to the platform, um, it would be built to state code. So it really depends if it's inside the building or it's outside the building. But either way, it, it, it is going to be built to either city or state code. But is the city code sufficient for a high volume, you know, transportation uh, tool? Oh, oh, we have certain requirements that they have to design it to. And what about the COO? Do they get the COO? mean COO. So, right. so the way the zoning text is written, if they get a bonus, that bonus area, um, so if they get a bonus for the transit improvement for, for an elevator, for example, that elevator has to be up and running before they can get a TCO on that bonus area. Okay. Um, and, and the same thing if it is in the station, right? Correct. Right. So going back on the maintenance, I think it's fine. Uh, I think, you know, fines and all those things are not helping a lot, but maybe you should do the way the, the, the city does you know, for the sidewalk. I mean, I think having the remedy and the, the capability of, 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 you know, adding the cost to, um, to the, the developer and to their taxes is really helpful. Is that what you were talking about earlier? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by taxes. Well, let's say they do not repair within two hours, three hours, four hours, uh, when, you know, and you decide you're going to take take on the repair and then you are charging them, right? The charge are going on their taxes or they're going, how do Letter you- Letter of credit, Christine. They can draw on that. Oh, okay, got it. All right, very good, thank you. Thank you, Christine. I'm sure with DOB looking after things, everything will be hunky-dory, uh, but, but, but good questions. Uh, Chris LeBron and then uh, Paul. Chris, are you there? Yes, I am. Good evening, everyone. I want to apologize for my absence last month. I uh, missed you all. Um, I want to thank the chair and thanking everybody for leaving more than gristle on the plate. All these big hitters came in to ask some very important questions. I just want to provide some context that way everyone truly understands where I'm coming from. I'm glad that um, James uh, mentioned Marty. Um, I grew up with a family member who was wheelchair bound his entire life. He lived with muscular dystrophy, he's no longer here. And I am the primary care uh, provider for my 93 year old grandmother who lives in the NYCHA complex who is now wheelchair bound as well. Um, additionally, I was a PSAL, I am a PSAL alum, Public School Athletic League alum, which means that I got to travel the rails and roads of this city uh, for four years of my life. And I witnessed uh, in my time then and in my time working as a public servant, uh, a great deal of inequity, not in the CBDs of Manhattan, um, but in the outer boroughs and communities of color. Um, I think of the seven line, the L, I think of the four five, 
uh, the one train. Um, and I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I know we're talking about CB4 here um, because there's so many conditions uh, within the zoning text that you presented to us. Additionally, um, you know, many of the interpretations of sufficiency of uh, receiving these bonuses will rely on the appointees of the governor and the mayor. I, I, I have deep concerns uh, that what we're trying to get here, um, while altruistic, um, ultimately serves um, special interest. Uh, that being said, we know historically the MTA has been a slush fund for the governor. He pulls money out of it whenever he pleases to fund his projects. So I find it a little bit uh, convenient uh, that we're looking to developers to take on the cost of what rightfully belongs to the state and has belonged to the state the entire time the MTA has been under its governance. My question is this, are you going to continue moving forward without amendments, Paul Mel, with these conditions that we've, we, we've highlighted in our questions? I really want to make sure that what we say here and what we capture and shrine in the letter doesn't fall on deaf ears because executives of state and city no longer wish to listen to or work with community boards. Chris, I, th I think our letter will be heard. Uh, it's a good point, but I think our letter and the Chelsea Land Use letter certainly will be heard. Also, as you know, it's a citywide text amendment, so it's going to be a lot of people weighing in. But we're sh we'll make sure our letters. Well, I, I know it's a citywide text amendment. It's, it's, I find it really unique, uh, just as a comment, not even as a question, that um, the presentation ignores special zoning um, the history of, uh, uh, of negotiations and, and enshrinement of special zoning. I, I'm incredibly concerned with that. Um, and, you know, as James pointed out, this 20% bonus in um, ceiling development communities, just like, there is nothing, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, <laughs> template about these special zones that have been negotiated and agreed upon. And so I strongly urge DCP and MTA and all the, the stakeholders to really go back and find better logic than this is how it gets done. It's inappropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Paul Devlin, co-chair of Chelsea <laughs> Committee. You give one comment since you're going to be able to make many comments. <laughs> well, no, but DCP isn't coming to us. This is my chance to try to ask them questions here. Because they're not coming to our meeting. You're, you're more special than us. Um, and we all know that. Um, I, I want to echo some of, uh, I, have, I, I do have more than one comment, as you can imagine. Um, and Joe, I would uh, want to have you follow up some more on the um, stacking of bonuses and the MIH versus accessibility bonuses. I think that's a very important issue. Um, but um, Chris or Munson, could you um, just revisit for me and better explain um, the differences on the slides where you say there's a maximum of 10 feet of available added on versus the 25% height increase in areas without a height with a height restriction. So how do you, what's that, that look conflicting to me? Can you explain that a little better for me? Sure. Um, so if a site is required to provide an easement, if they're within 50 feet of a subway station in one of those applicable zoning districts, and this is separate from the bonus, um, if the MTA determines that an easement is required on the site and they do provide an easement, then they get 10 additional feet of, of, of a height increase on top of the maximum building height limit that is established in the zoning. Um, and, then, and, and, and the reason why we are providing that is because, you know, easements take up space and we're trying to facilitate the development as much as possible because you're taking away a chunk of, 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 their, of their property for a future access point. But then it can then you add on a 25% bonus if they do significant improvements to the station. So you get the 10 feet plus the 25%. That, that's, that's completely separate. So for an well, easement. It's one building. So I don't know how it's separate. So if an easement for um, there, there, again, this is a citywide tax amendment and it applies to so many different sites in the, in the city. And if there is some weird site where it's harder to build 
or, or develop on that site. And on top of that, we are asking for an easement on that site. It could be very difficult for the development site to provide that easement. So in those situations where it is, you know, that where they need additional height to accommodate the easement, they would have to go through an authorization process that would allow for, a, you know, beyond the 10 feet, um, an additional 25% uh, height on top of what they have. And, and that again is to address, um, that's really to address unique site conditions. That's, and the developer has to demonstrate that the, the, the additional height that is being requested is needed. It's not 25% straight up, it's up to 25%. So it's the minimum extent necessary and, and, and the developer must demonstrate that it's needed. Okay. And, and, and this, <laughs> Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that leads. That does, it kind of leads into my next question. In that, you know, we talk about significant station improvements um, can grant a twenty percent FAR increase. Um, on slide twenty-seven, it looks like you have a station that shows a long hallway at a grade, and it has a series of steps in it, and that a wheelchair ramp is put on the sides of the steps. Now, inserting two wheelchair ramps would be a significant improvement for accessibility through a station. But is two wheelchair ramps worthy of a 20% increase in FAR? And so the question is, how do you define significant? And then second is, is there a correlation between improvements and steps in increase? Because somebody might get 5% FAR, somebody might get 10% FAR, somebody might get 20% FAR, depending on the significance of the improvements. And is there a grid that we can follow? No, this is a, oh, Vincent, do you want to respond first? No. Um, that I think that image, um, I, I can't remember where it was. Um, it, do, it, it doesn't matter about the image yeah, itself. I'm saying like- A, 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 ramp, a, a ramp would probably, well, ramps are very difficult also just because they take up so much space. Um, <laughs> so it's, we rarely have ramps, um, but I, 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 would, I would say that a ramp probably wouldn't have the same amount of um, zoning bonus as something as complicated as an elevator, which also requires an elevator machine room and so, and so on and so on. Okay, but can I just jump in for a moment? I think, I think we're, we're stuck on a presentation. This presentation was representational. It's not saying that the ramp gets you a bonus. There's actually a real no, program sure. that exists today, Chris, correct? For no, Joe, Joe, no, please hold on. I did. I, I used that as an example because it was a very no, I know, but I, my point. My question is, what? How do they define significant improvement, and is there a correlation between the size of the significance and the amount of increased FAR? That was an very actual real program. To the text amendment. Right. There's a real program that exists for that, Paul, and it's under the current special permit, and it's not just like a definition. There's a whole process that that they go through. But my right. question for you kind of ties into Paul's thing. Chris, that's a special permit, correct? The current program? The current program is a special permit. Which gives you full public program. review. This is, is, are all these new uh, increases authorizations? Not all. If you want an additional, uh, if you want additional height beyond the 25% threshold that I just no, mentioned. No, bulk, bulk. Um, height, height is part of bulk, but if you're talking about the 20% FAR bonus, then yes, it, it is part of, it, it would be an authorization. Not Which means permit. it is an authorization, not a full public review as a special permit. That's right. Correct. So, so, I, uh, question. I, so, my, so that goes right, back to my question, Joe, if I can let them answer right. the question is that's right. how do you define significant and how, what is the grading for the improvement? Can, can someone get 5% FAR for someone somewhat significant versus 20% for something greatly significant? And that's what I'm asking and I'd like to hear the answer. It, it, would, it would depend on the type of improvement. Um, so, I mean, and, and the, the complexity of the improvement and, and what's, what's in that scope of improvements. I mean, if, if it's a simple stair and it's relatively straightforward, it may not be 20%. I, I, I don't know, but it is. The zoning it, doesn't work that way. You don't get a percentage up to 20%. It's a 20% bonus and there's a program approved to get there. Isn't that correct, Chris? No, it's up to 20%. It's not a guarantee that it will automatically so, have a 20% Joe, Joe, That's why I'm asking the question. It says up to, and it's at the discretion of the chair. 
And so that's why I'm asking the question. It's because it is very different from normal and it does indicate up to, and it's at the discretion. And so I'm trying to get- Which means no real public review no of this thing. No public review. No, it's just that, done by the chair, discretionary, and can uh, be totally uh, done. Uh, on if, if I could chime in- so Joe, the, can you let them answer my question? The, the determination that it, the up to 20% is actually in the current 74634 of the zoning resolution. So that that uh, that is, it is basically the same. It's the up to 20% that has to correlate with the with the public benefit and and the and the package of improvements, i.e., an elevator. I think well, I think Paul, the answer is no. There is no systematic quid pro quo. I think there is. That's what they are saying. There is one. I, My understanding is that there is one. There are there are grading of how much people are going to get. I but just I want to specify that the authorization would be referred out to the community board. It is not just a chairperson, you know, um, city planning commission chair sign off. It's it's it would be subject to full, you know, city planning commission review and approval. It is discretionary. Um, it, it, this is a discretionary action, right? So it would have it's to not be a full Euler. It's not a full Euler. It doesn't go to city council. Um, That's correct. And, and this and the reason why we've crafted this bonus this way is because it was a response to a city council report that was released, the, the Let's Go report, um, to, to simplify the, the application process to incentivize uh, more developments to be able to provide accessibility improvements to these stations because that is an important, you know, um, it, it, it's definitely a priority to, to make stations accessible. Um, it, with a discretionary review, there is no specified rate. You get, if you provide an elevator, you get X amount of you know floor area and square footage. It, it really is a discretionary and qualitative review process that is subject to MTA approval. The MTA will have to, you know, sign off on these improvements. And if a station is not accessible, they will have to provide an elevator. They will have to they will have to make the the station accessible for sure. It's not just you know if you provide a bike rack that you get a twenty percent uh, FAR bonus. It, it has to be a significant improvement. It's got to be substantial. It's got to enhance the station in a way that will upgrade the uh, that will upgrade access. That will upgrade capacity, or you know and or. Um, uh, and increase some, uh, circulation within within the station itself. So, and traditionally, these applications have at least you know um, uh, warranted elevators, you know escalators, new entrances. It, we're, we're not talking about small little you know improvements. We're talking on pretty substantive improvements. So it's on the developer to demonstrate that. You know, it, it, it's not based, the floor area is not based on the cost of the improvement. It really is based on the benefit that is being provided through the improvements to the station. Right, right. Chris, I appreciate, I, I appreciate that answer. And it does, it, it starts to tackle my concern is that there is a discretionary authorization without public input. Um, and as Chris raised, you know, there's a lot of politics involved and you might be here, you're here today talking to us in 10 years, it'll be a whole different set of people and how they define significant and how they define discretionary is a little bit concerning to me, all right? But I have one more, one more question, if, if you all don't if mind. I, if I could quickly respond though, it, it actually uh, does go to the community board and the borough, and the borough president, these, um, any zoning bonus applications under, the, under this proposal. Oh, it does, okay. They don't right, go to the city Thank council you. to have final word on it. And in prior special permits, City council members have always been able to negotiate more benefit than the non-elected representatives, right? So city planning commission is not an elected representative. We're just trying to deal with the public process here, knowing that it's easy for the development community to work it and to work it not to the benefit of the MTA or the benefit of the city. That's very common. We're very familiar with it. If, right, if, so if, I, I, if I, if I, if I, if I may, I, I work, I work in the transit oriented development group at the MTA. And I am currently, uh, uh, I have a few projects where I, I am talking to developers about certain improvements for a bonus. And we work very hard and we push 
these developers very hard. It's not like it's, we just, it's a cakewalk. We make sure that the size of the bonus that they want is commensurate with the improvement that we are getting. And um, first of all, as many of you probably know, we're not an easy agency, that's a given, but these stations are so complicated and it is not easy making these improvements. It is really, really complicated. And it's, you know, we're not talking about dollars, but it is very expensive. It actually is more, it's a little cheaper for them than it is for us. They could do it faster. It is not easy. It's, it's not a cakewalk for them. It's not like they're getting a hand, a handout. They are, you know, but they have to want to do it. So, but they're not going to automatically we, get a 20% bonus. We push really hard to make sure we get what we need. And it, it, it may not be automatic a 20%. If it's just going to be an elevator, then we'll say, we know what goes into making that improvement. And we know it, it, it shouldn't be the size of this bonus. So I, I just, I just want to give you kind of the inner workings. It doesn't work as easily as, as it looks. I appreciate that, Munson. And, and, I, and I, I don't mean to discredit the work that you're doing. I discredit the work of your successor. So <laughs> let's, the other final thing I want to ask about um, is on zoning lots and that zoning lots within 1500 feet in a, a central business district will qualify for these easements and bonuses. Um, and as, as Joe pointed out, we have zoning lots that are merged that are up to a block long. And so you might have the corner of a zoning lot be 1500 feet from a station. The zoning lot is another five or 600 feet. And then the increased FAR and height bonuses go onto a building that's 2000 feet away from a subway station. Um, and so I'm a little bit concerned about the terminology zone, zoning lot versus building lot perhaps. So is there a different word that we can use to that's restrict why. that to you know, lots that are within that 1500 feet as opposed to the zoning lot, merged zoning lots go out too far. Good point, good point, Paul. Chris? Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, zoning Zoning lot is really the term that we're using and it is the term that is used in the zoning text itself. So if a zoning lot um, is within 1500 feet or 500 feet outside of central business districts, and if it is, in an R9 and R10 district, then yes, it, it would be a, it would be able to apply for this for this bonus. Yeah, um, I just I, I do want to that I have trouble with. I do want to specify though that only the portion that is within R9 and R10 would be able to benefit from this um, additional FAR bonus, um, provided that they, they that they construct the improvement itself. Well, I, I, you, I, I'd like to Paul, Joe. Question. Maybe you could come up with another term for that. All right, thank you. I think, Great presentation. Well, I think that will, be, that will be a concern that we raise. That's an important concern. And uh, Chris, I'm sure you understand our concern about that, Paul, the, the Paul raising. I, I want to try to have another presentation, but Betty McIntosh has not yet. So unmute and let us have it. Going to unmute. Uh, thank you for the presentations. There you Cl clarified a number of things that I was wondering about. Um, but I do have some questions. Maybe I'll tell, ask them all at the same time so it doesn't get too tedious. Um, on the map that we have for Chelsea, um, can the bonus be used outside the brown area? That's one question. Um, and does the improvement need to be on the zoning lot or right next to the zoning lot? Can it be, I don't know, half a block away? Um, let me see what else. Oh, you talked a lot about the process for certification uh, or if no, for, the, for a um, authorization. And I need you to talk about the process of community review in terms of a certification. <clears throat> and is there any of that? And, um, we are very interested in huge merge uh, lots together and the effect on uh, the bonus. 
So um, th thank you for your questions. Um, so your first question is whether the bonus is able to be utilized outside of the um, you call it orange, I call it brown. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it would not be able to, um, the, the bonus would not be applicable outside of those color shaded areas on that map. Okay. Yeah, and, and but one, one of the new features that is being introduced through this um, new bonus mechanism is that if, if adopted, uh, sites would be able to provide off-site improvements. So today, the subway bonus special permit requires that the site be next to a station. What we're saying is that um, sites that are maybe at a distance from a station would be able to participate in the program if they provide an offsite improvement to that specific station. I, I, I just, just to follow up on that, I don't quite understand that. So if, if mm -hmm. something is a block away, mm -hmm. then does the developer still pay for the improvement and maintain the improvement. I don't see how that could work. We, we don't have a payment in lieu option for this. They have to deliver and construct the improvement. Even um, if it's a block away. But they, yes, if it's a if it's a block away and they're in an R9 and R10 district, then they are able to utilize uh, the bonus. Oh, oh, I see. All right, do you have examples of that at all? Um, it, it's an it's a new feature. It's new. Uh, it's new. So okay. currently, we don't have um, under the special the subway bonus special permit. We don't we don't really have uh, examples of offsite improvements. There are um, specific application few applications in East Midtown, which has its own you know framework, which have facilitated offsite improvements. So, um, but that's you don't mean, you that's don't a specific mean framework. Uh, sorry. You don't mean you don't mean offsite to the station. You mean offsite off from the development. Offsite from the zoning right. lot. From the developer. Yeah, mm -hmm. from from the development. That's from, right. From the adjacency to the station. That's right. right. Um, and Can I add a point also to this? So if if it's offsite from the development and they're building an elevator, for example, and they're building an elevator inside the station because you know we need multiple elevators to make a station accessible, um, they they pay and they build the improvement. But because the elevator would not be inside their building, um, uh, they give they would give the MTA um, a maintenance and capital improvement buyout. So because the MTA would be maintaining that elevator, because we don't want the developers contractors to come into our station, um, so they give the MTA a maintenance buyout as well as a buyout for the future capital replacement of that elevator. Okay, that, that's, that's useful. They, they actually like sort of pay the money. Uh, okay, and then if it's not in their building itself, but down the block or something, then do they still get a bonus? Yeah. If, if they construct the improvement, yes. Even though they're not using up space in their building. That's right. Okay, all right. And can you just talk about how the community is involved with the certification? So the certification is for the easement requirement. Again, any site that is within 50 feet of a station that is in an applicable zoning district would have to come to the MTA and the chair of the city planning commission to get a certification. Uh, and, and that certification is really determining whether an easement will be provided on that zoning lodge or not. And um, it, it, it's it's done through the MTA and the chairperson, so it would not go through, um, it would not be referred out to the community boards. Not okay. even a notification requirement for that? No, um, it, it's, it's really a sign off to make sure that the developer has spoken to the MTA and has had that conversation about whether an easement is, is needed. But if the, the easement is needed, then, then what happens? If the consequence easement, is an, mm -hmm. a possible height increase. So there should be a notification for this at least. Yeah, there's a next step after that, right? If, so, if, an, easement is, if an easement is required, um, then the developer will have to submit a site plan uh, to the MTA and there would be a, a process where the MTA and the, the developer would uh, determine where, where the easement would be located on the zoning lots. Um, it, it's it's not determining uh, 
it, it's it's not the design process of the specific improvement. It's just really locating where the easement volume is. But what about the highest? Well, how much they are going to get for that? Um, let's let's let's, let's let sorry. Betty Betty finish up, and then we'll go to Christine to solve this problem. Uh, <laughs> Betty. Okay, so I just just the certification is not part. it is not part is not something that goes to the community. Is that what I get from it? That's right. It's okay. um it's it's very comparable. Uh, the the pops program also um it's it's a it's a comparable um process. It's my understanding. Right, right. Betty, oh, are... sorry, okay. can I just you know make what? one more? One um, um, the certification is for the easement. If if let's say an easement is needed and that's been certified, if there are additional constraints where the developer needs a height increase up to twenty five percent, they would need an authorization for that, and so then they would come back to city planning to demonstrate that they that they need that additional height. And if, um, you know, if that goes, if that gets approved, that would go to the community to review. Okay. Christine, does that, does that answer your point, Christine? Uh, not 100%. The, what I'm unclear about is that once you have the easement, right, do you agree that there is a need for an easement? At that point, there is an automatic imp uh, gift of, of you know, uh, 10 feet or what, what is given to the developer at that point? So we, we've crafted the zoning provisions in a way that is very targeted and is really to ensure that developments are not severely burdened by the provision of an easement. So it, it's, it's really just to make sure that they're able to maximize their FAR today. I'm not asking um, that question. I, I don't think and, and, so, and so, yes, if they provide an easement that they would get targeted zoning relief through the certification process. Okay. Yeah, I really you're not hear, you're not hearing the question. We know we understand the easement. That's the technical part to get the MTA the need get something inside the building line. Got that. Is there an automatic grant of ten feet, or as Nabila said, that there's a return for authorization to get that ten feet or that twenty five percent? No. So you get the ten feet, but beyond that, Got it. you would have to come back to us. So you get so one, one floor. Is the deal. 10 feet is the deal. You have an easement, you have 10 feet and that goes, right? That's yeah. right. No Got it. Automa automatic, right. nothing. Thank you. You want more, you go for authorization right. to go further. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Betty, Betty, how are we doing on your list? Oh, I think I'm done for now. Great, thank you, Betty. Um, Dolores, are you there? I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I'm... Um, I just wanted to reiterate what we're clearly hearing is, is that, you know, this district has very um, specific zoning that we've fought for very hard. And what we're hearing is there's a lot of discretion in what you're proposing. So there's got to be a way to go back and think about how to protect the special districts that are hard fought for so that they are compatible with the objective of bringing accessibility. And there's gotta be a way to do that. Um, I can't, it, it, there's no excuse to say, well, it's citywide, it's citywide, it's citywide. Well, yes, it's citywide. But again, if we have worked very hard to ensure that the community concerns are built into zoning within our district, we should not be giving away the farm. And that's what I keep hearing is that we're giving away a lot and we're not considering some of the unique um, uh, aspects of the zoning that we have put in place in this district. And there's gotta be a way to go ahead and make a carve out for special districts, special zoning, where that includes an additional process that either has um, the public review that we're looking for, or that you are not giving away as much as, as proposed in the citywide um, um, amendments that you're trying to make. Thank you, Dolores. Uh, I have one question before I go to Joe. Uh, Chris, the beautification, the beautification, quote unquote, who signs off on that? Is it DCP? 
again, you know, any sort of beautification or, or rather a better word would be, you know, uh, enhancement to the general environment to the station would have to be signed off by the MTA. Um, and, and again, it's, it, it most likely would not be, it would not be a standalone improvement. Uh, it would be part of a larger package that would, uh, that would include accessibility improvements and capacity enhancements to the station. Um, okay. and, and it would be subject to city planning commission review and approval gotcha. beyond gotcha. the MTA. Thank you, Chris. Joe, did you have uh, one, one last comment? Then I want to close. Not, not a comment so much as a, well, one specific thing in the, R10 equivalents or the C6, which is in our district, right? Um, the, that 20, have there been, when you've done it in, in the central business district, have there been bonuses granted for less than 20% in these high density areas? Isn't it, a, my understanding is usually a full suite of improvements, which gets you to the 20%. Maybe Munson or Chris might be able to answer that. It's a very specific question. I've always believed that it was a really pushed hard to get a full improvement to get to 20%. Am I incorrect? Well, we haven't had that many. <laughs> right. Um, so I, 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 I couldn't give you an answer because at mm -hmm. least in my time at the EMT, I can certainly come back. But we, for the very reasons that we've outlined, um, the number, the small number of sites and also um, um, the, the risk that developers take on, um, mm -hmm in the current process. Um, um, I don't think it all will come out to exactly 20%. I, I'm not really sure. I can come okay. back to you with an, an answer to the question, but we just haven't had that many applications. And then in the areas where easements are required today, right? Like along 8th Avenue, for example, that's a requirement. I know that for a fact, 42nd and 8th, for example. Um, do we need to put another requirement in if it's required today? In, in, in those areas, they those provisions would stay in place. Okay. And then the third piece is, how does it work with the stacking of bonuses? Because, for example, we have a site in Chelsea that just went through our housing committee for a, a, a senior citizen project, which got a bonus for providing public uh, privately funded senior citizen affordable housing. That is on a corner of the subway station. It, how does the height happen there? We I went through a bunch of committees. And there was a height increase for the senior housing. Would there be now a second height increase for relief for bringing the both the easements and or a bonus at that location? That's on twenty third and eighth. I, I I will have to get back to you on that. I, I'm not too familiar with that project site, so I'll have to look into it. But generally speaking, for other types of bonuses, um, there wouldn't be a stacking um, situation. Um, it, stacking would not be allowed for, you know, for, for transit and other types of bonuses. Like it's actually um, not a, it's, it's, both, it's, like, it's a bonus and a height relief. So there is a height relief component to that program too. I I'll have to get back to you on that specific site project or project site. And Thank to you. echo Dolores, just to sum it up, I think there is a lack of understanding that there's a history of zoning on the West side. And I think it is not just a citywide effort, it's how to make the two things come together so everything is reconciled. And we support this general idea, but reconciling it is our goal here. That's why you've heard a lot of hard questions about why this or why that. So it doesn't remove serious accomplishments the community, particular to this district, has achieved over a long time. We look forward really to working with you on that. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to thank Munson and Nabella, Nabila and Chris for putting up with us and, and really excellent questions from Paul and Christine and, and Leslie. Get, you know, I know you're going to get back to Leslie on the question he had about the restaurants. And uh, Chris LeBron raised a very important issue. Dolores uh, and James Wallace, a really important discussion. I'm so glad Betty is writing this letter because uh, <laughs> Uh, one question, Nabila, when, when do we have to respond? So the deadline is June 14th. And so I will work to follow up um, on some of these questions that we weren't able to answer tonight. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll send out an email about that. And what do you have against the Chelsea committee that you won't go visit them? I don't. 
understand. So I've been talking to Janine and Jesse um, just because there are so many citywide proposals and many private applications coming to both committees in the next few months. We're trying to split our time. Um, and so Chelsea's going to be hearing the um, hotel special permit proposal. I was going to say we get hotel special permit <clears throat> and I will I will point out that Nabila has been communicative with us. Uh, we've been emailing back and forth and I appreciate the work that she's been doing. With us, so thank yeah, you. I don't blame you. I wouldn't go before that committee either. You think we're bad. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I'm thank sorry. You. We, we're going to have to move on. We have one more presentation. <laughs> That's very important. But unfortunately, we only have about 15 minutes to get through it before we have a hard stop. No, just kidding. Just kidding, Dan. Um, this I want to welcome uh, everybody um, from the uh, Slaughterhouse Project. You've been, I see John is here with us and uh, you've been with us many times before. This is a remarkable accomplishment in, in so many ways. So we're very happy to see you tonight. There's Lauren, uh, welcome you all. You, you know everybody on the committee um, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. Janine, did we have anybody from the public that lasted through this zoning? That uh, there was a, I saw, uh, let me see, Miriam Fisher, but she put her hand down. Okay. Miriam, did you have any anything to say? Uh, yeah, I put some, I am from the public, I'm an attendee. I was told that it would be opportunity uh, tonight to make some comments. Um, and I put some of the things that in the uh, Q&A, if you would look at that. Um, somebody had said something uh, about why doesn't the MTA do that? The disability activists have been fighting the MTA for decades. They are denying they're in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, over and over. Um, as an example, in Chelsea, um, they do renovation without any elevators. Everybody knows 23rd and 6th has Celis Manor, which is a residence for people with visual impairments and disabilities. It was closed for months with nine very interesting mosaics. Uh, no elevator was um, added. This is now being challenged in court that they can't close the station for renovation or when they thought that the L was going to be closed along 14th Street. Uh, there was, except for First Avenue, uh, there was no plan for adding any other elevators. There was a lawsuit to get an elevator added to 6th Avenue and now the latest is 7th Avenue. Everything has been a fight and it isn't only for people with disabilities, it's for seniors, it's for people with bad backs, bad knees. I assume most people are aware of the mother uh, who died uh, trying to get her stroller down steep stairs, a uh, young woman in her 20s, it's for delivery people, luggage, it's uh, for a whole host of people with needs for an elevator. And I think at the beginning, they said about half a million people in New York City have ambulatory disabilities. Of that half a million, I think most of them do not negotiate the subway because it's just too hard. And yeah. many would, and it would expand their lives. This is the chance to get the MTA developers to pay for some of the elevators so that they that money can then be used for uh, elevators, 900 stations left to add elevators to make this accessible. I don't think it's gonna happen in my lifetime. Well, keep these projects are, are a stab at, and I hear the fears of uh, the developers and gentrification and all the bad things that are happening in our city. Uh, but this is a, a, a human right for transportation. And these are people who do not uh, have that the same things that we take for granted. I think we all agree with you, Miriam. This is certainly something the city needs to improve. Thank you so much for staying with us through this long presentation. And you're welcome to stay through the next one too, uh, which we hope will be a little shorter. But thank you, Miriam, for those comments. Uh, Janine, was there anybody else from that? No? Nobody else. Okay, great. I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren. Uh, or John, uh, whoever wants to take it on. 
Sure. Uh, we will take it. Well, I'll, I'll take it from here, JD. We'll get sure. started. Um, thank you so much for the kind words about the project. We really want to thank you, Joe, Jesse, and uh, many of your um, uh, community board members. Uh, you've been a part of this um, to the thick and thin, um, part of this site a lot longer than I have. Uh, and your input has been um, and fingerprints have been all over this project and for the better. Uh, so we really thank you for that. Uh, we're excited to having, having gotten to this point. I know it's been a long time coming. Um, and uh, I think once the slides are up on the, on the screen here, we'll- You wanna go ahead and pull it up? Yeah. Yep, and uh, we will try to be brief. Um, well, I, I think that our presentation alone is probably gonna take less than uh, 30 minutes, and we want to leave ample time for uh, questions uh, and answers as they come up, uh, which we'll reserve at the end of the presentation. Um, okay, so uh, the site, uh, as many of you know, uh, was awarded through an EDC RFP. Um, the site is currently uh, occupied by the New York City Police Department. Their fleet for the um, Counterterrorism Times Square unit is currently occupying the site. The city was RFP the site uh, in order to create uh, affordable housing without subsidy through economic development. Um, so in this case, um, this proposal will, will include a hotel, other commercial uses, and affordable housing. Uh, and we'll get right into it. Before you go on, I just want to say again, thank you so much, Community Board 4. We wouldn't be here without you. And um, I want you to know that our partners with CUCS are also here tonight to talk to you a little bit about that part of the program. So go ahead, John. Sorry. Okay, next slide, please. Introduce folks. So uh, my name is John Butler. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President of Development for Radson Development. Uh, the development team is Radson Development uh, with a joint venture with uh, Kings Point Heights. Um, I will present uh, the slight location and context. Um, I know, again, I know many people are familiar with the site, but for those who aren't, uh, I'll quickly orient uh, everybody into what the site entails and where the location is. The project timing and proposed actions as we are now officially within the Euler process, and this is our community board land use hearing. Uh, the proposed building program, uh, the unit distribution, and uh, some of the economic development benefits of the project. Uh, I will then hand the um, presentation over to uh, Joe Diginova and Doug James from CUCS, who will be presenting regarding the social services of the building. Uh, and then I will be handing the presentation over to Dan Kaplan at FX Collaborative, who will go over some of the design features as well as sustainability features. Then finally, um, Julie Polak from Sam Schwartz will present the 39th Street improvements as well as pedestrian and bicycle treatment. Um, as you've already heard, Lauren George is on the call as well as representatives from Ackerman, um, as well as New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, who will be available to answer any questions uh, that you may have that pertain to specific program items. Okay, next slide. So uh, that uh, small yellow rectangle uh, there towards the center of your screen uh, is, the, is the site in question. Uh, again, currently city owned, uh, occupied by the New York City Police Department. It is directly adjacent to uh, the Javits extension uh, to the west, uh, to the north is the bus depot. And then along 11th Avenue to the east are um, a couple of development sites, Silverstein, Rock Rose, Black House, um, of all development sites along 11th Avenue. So what is, or was really currently sort of a barren corridor is quickly becoming uh, into a very active corridor leading into uh, the existing Javits building to the south. Okay, next slide. So uh, these are some recent photos that were taken earlier this year um, uh, of the site. Uh, in particular, you're looking, um, if you're, you're south of the site, looking uh, northwest. 
uh, that the the photo on the bottom left hand of your screen is is looking at the um, site straight on just to the south you'll see the west 39th street bed of street um, and we will talk about that a little more though it's not part of the Euler of action per se uh, it's a very important part to this project um, that we would like to present to the community board where uh, it's not a through street, but uh, we are currently working with the state who has jurisdiction of this bed of street to program it as a public plaza. Okay, next, next slide. So here you'll see the Javits extension uh, in the background. Um, you'll see the, the parking lot in the foreground um, currently occupied by police vehicles. Um, want to mention the nod to New York City's and New York State's recovery that the Javits Center we hear will be operational a week from today at 30% capacity. So uh, we are happy to see that happen. Um, and we are working with the Javits Center as well to create some connectivity, which we'll talk about later in the, in the presentation. Next slide. And here's uh, just the site again. Uh, if you're north of the site, looking down to 11th Avenue, you can see some of that had the development that's taken course to the south of the site um, and, and see the 11th Avenue corridor. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, this is where we are within our project timing. I mean, it, it certainly doesn't represent um, much of the discussions that we've had with um, the community stakeholders such as yourselves uh, to get to this point, but we're happy to report that on June 12th, um, we uh, received a conceptual approval from the Public Design Commission. Um, should uh, remind folks that this site is remaining a public site. It's being ground leased to the development team. Um, so when the site is uh, still in city ownership, it'll be subject to the Public Design Commission. We've been working with them extensively. As you can see, we've received conceptual approval and we'll be receiving uh, final approval later on within our process. But before that, uh, earlier last month, um, when we received our draft uh, environmental impact statement, uh, notice of completion, uh, and then certification recently of the Euler application on April 19th. Um, the the uh, bullet in bold is where we are today presenting to you. Um, soon and following into the summer, we will be presenting to the borough president's office. And then in the late summer, early fall, we expect to have the city planning commission hearing, as well as the final environmental impact statement notice of completion and vote. Uh, that will bring us to the uh, vote and review of the board uh, later in the year. And then final uh, public design commission approval um, we then, with all the approvals uh, mentioned, we expect to close uh, within 12 months from now and then uh, have our construction permits in hand uh, by the summer of 2022, um, following which we will have a DOT revocable consent to program the, uh, the bed of street at West 39th Street. Okay, next slide, please. So here's a, a visual uh, chart of where we are in the process, um, layered on to some of the uh, approvals or, or timeline or milestones we discussed are also um, uh, review by HPD due to the inclusionary housing component. Um, they will be reviewing the plans and, uh, to make sure we, we are in compliance with the mandatory inclusionary housing, as well, of course, our uh, Department of Building submission, uh, which will happen later on in the process. Um, and then uh, on to final approval. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So our proposed actions, uh, which we are taking uh, for our rezoning. So uh, it's a zoning map amendment. We are rezoning from an M15 to a C64. To the right of your screen, you can see the, the context of the neighborhood. Uh, our site is a little more akin to the um, zoning across 11th Avenue where the development is taking place. The M15 is really dominated by the Javits Center and the bus depot. Um, and then we are forming our own special Hudson Yards district. 
the sub-district will be um, Subdistrict G, the Special Hudson Yards District, and then we will have an appendix for a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Uh, there will be a site selection and an acquisition to, a, to facilitate the new NYPD garage, about 39,000 square feet. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, on to the new building program. So the total development is roughly about 700,000 square feet. Uh, programming will include a grocery store, uh, the NYPD replacement parking garage, which will um, occupy a, a portion of the ground floor to accommodate some of the oversized vehicles, as well as floors two through four. Um, office space, which will uh, occupy the ground floor up to the fifth floor along the north side and east side of the building. The hotel tower, which will, which will be the south tower or the tower to your left, if you're looking at the rendering on the screen. Um, 680 keys proposed. And then the tower to the north, which is the taller tower, are the 350 units of affordable housing. Uh, repeat that number of units 350 units of affordable housing sounds good thank you got it so focusing on the the south tower to give a little more detail and context about the uh about the the program uh roughly 280,000 square feet of hotel use it's a 56 story uh tall tower um 650 feet uh, again, 680 guest rooms and then 19,000 square feet of amenity space. So that uh, includes a uh, ballroom, um, uh, the terrace, uh, there'll be um, uh, restaurant space as well and um, programmed amenity space by the hotel user. Okay, next slide. So the North Tower, which is the affordable housing tower, will be uh, the taller, taller of the towers, uh, about 237,000 square feet, 70, 57 stories tall, which taps out at 680 feet. Um, that's 700, uh, 274 units will be uh, affordable housing available to moderate middle incomes. Uh, we have elected for option two within the mandatory inclusionary housing program. Um, the other 75 units will be supportive housing units for uh, formerly in, uh, ho homeless individuals and families. And there will be a social service office included on the fifth floor um, in addition to the amenity space. Uh, that uh, office, in addition to the amenity space, will also um, have a terrace space as well on the fifth floor um, associated with that program. Okay, next slide. So the unit distribution, um, again, we wanna emphasize um, the, the community board force foresight into um, uh, the inclusion of the supportive housing. This was not an original contemplation. Um, given uh, where the city is headed, we see that supportive housing is becoming more and more in demand, uh, especially um, now that we've gone through the COVID crisis, we're seeing a lot of families struggle um, and with the uh, moratorium on evictions, looks like it will be lifted in August. The city is definitely preparing for more uh, families and individuals entering the shelter program and then in need of, of housing. So um, this couldn't come soon enough. Again, we thank you guys um, for that foresight and are, are happy to include it in this project. Um, the breakdown uh, between the, uh, for the moderate units is, is fairly equitable. Um, in terms of applying the, the same rate of studios, one, twos, and threes to the different programs. Um, and then the MIH unit component that you see on the bottom right is uh, layered into that. It's not in addition to. So if you're tallying them up and your math is saying, hey, that's more than 300 units, you would be correct. The 114 units are MIH units, which will overlap onto the supportive units and moderate income. Okay, next slide. So some of the job creation. Um, so we expect at least uh, 1,500 construction jobs to be created from this uh, uh, project. Um, almost 400 we expect to be permanent. 
Those include um, building service jobs, um, the uh, case managers, social workers, et cetera, that will uh, be working in the, so in the social service office. Uh, the grocery store, it will employ about 30 people. Office space, about 50 people. Hotel, restaurant, about 275. Um, we have a commitment to local hiring. Uh, our, our MWBE participation goal is 35% of jobs. Um, I should mention Radson Development is, has a track record of you know, affordable housing developments with the city. Um, we are very accustomed to MWBE goals and I've met them all the time. So this project will be no different. We expect to achieve our MWBE goal here. Um, and also we've met with both um, the hotel union as well as 32BJ. Uh, we expect this to be a union project, both with the hotel union and service employees. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to our partners at CUCS to walk you through some of the social service programming. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot, John. Good evening, everybody. My name is Joe DiGenova. I'm the CEO of CUCS, the Center for Urban Community Services. <clears throat> you can see on the side here the range of programming we provide for people. We were born at Columbia University in the early 80s at the dawn of the modern homeless crisis and pretty much have stayed focused on homeless and formerly homeless people in terms of who we um, serve. We're considered one of the creators of the supportive housing model. <clears throat> as most of you probably know, supportive housing is affordable housing with support services on site, typically provided in an integrated environment with a mixed tenancy where the supportive units are usually populated by people who are formerly homeless with some kind of significant challenge like mental health problem. And then the remaining units <clears throat> are just for people who need affordable housing. This provides an integrated situation and, and, and is, 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 a, is in and of itself a good form of therapy for the formerly homeless people. Um, we, uh, as I said, started providing affordable, uh, sorry, supportive housing in 1984. We currently provide services in over 2,600 units of supportive housing in the city um, in 19 different sites. We have about 850 units in development, not counting this project. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the kind of services we'll provide on site. We provide the full range of services that the city requires. So that's outreach and engagement, assessment and service planning, case management services, supportive counseling, crisis prevention and intervention, substance abuse counseling, entitlements assistance. When we have families on site, we provide educational advocacy, helping parents with their children and their situations in school, household management support and coaching, information referral to offsite services if people need something we don't provide, and escorts to appointments if people need that kind of help too. In addition to that, which is what the city re requires, we also provide employment services in all of our supportive housing sites. Once tenants who can't use the mainstream community-based services get an optimal result. Med medication monitoring, payee services for people who get SSI. The funding for this project, the service funding and the rental subsidies will come through the New York, New York 1515 program. And um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Doug James, our COO and the person who's in charge of property development for us to tell you a little bit more about the staffing and the, and the space we'll be using in the building. Thanks, Joe. I'm Doug James, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for CUCS. Um, as Joe mentioned, uh, 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 and Jonathan, broad range of services and robust staffing of the staff on site. Um, I think it's interesting for you guys to know like the level of professionalism that we provide. So the program director, the assistant program director, and two clinical uh, coordinators are all going to be uh, LCSWs. Uh, those are licensed clinical social workers. Um, in addition to that, there's going to be a day of psych, uh, psychiatric services for, you know, as Joe mentioned, for those who you know, aren't, you know, properly served or adequately served 
by community-based uh, providers and a day of primary medical care. You know, the folks that we serve, uh, in addition to having, you know, uh, psychiatric issues, there's a lot of comorbidity. Uh, and so there's, there's, you know, primary medical uh, uh, needs that uh, are often have gone unmet prior to being housed permanently. Um, uh, services will be offered uh, on site from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday with four to seven um, additional hours on one weekend day. Um, uh, and, and, you know, just a little bit of more background about our staff and our services. Um, we have, you know, a lot of programs and a very deep bench. Uh, you know, one of the things about CUCS, um, the staff stay with us and they advance with us um, and we provide educational assistance and that provides, you know, the, you know, the next generation of leaders and most of our hiring when we open new programs uh, comes from, you know, staff that were being promoted from other programs. Um, uh, uh, and that's, and that's kind of how we keep our culture stable as we expand and add new sites. And on the senior leadership side, um, most of the managers, senior managers overseeing the programs have uh, about 20 years, average of 20 years of experience um, at CUCS. Um, so uh, I think we wanted to take a look at the next slide and look at the actual physical plant. So on the, on the side there, you'll see the uh, space devoted to our social services staff and the partnership between CUCS, we've done a lot. We do a lot of joint development. We do our own programs. Um, uh, in our own uh, sites. And, and the, the partnership between Radson and, and CUCS in designing this, um, uh, the social services space has been uh, really productive and uh, a you know, great example of the kind of partnership that can be struck between a nonprofit uh, and, a, and a developer to kind of achieve the level of services uh, that, we, that we like to deliver. Just say one thing in closing, John. We have a simple rule at CUCS. <clears throat> we want our, our services to be of the quality that we would want for ourselves or for a member of our family. We strive to, we strive to achieve that every day. Thank you very much, Doug and Joe. Really appreciate that. And I just want to point out too that you think this is the only project I've been a part of where the uh, Social Service Office will have a terrace with unobstructed views of Manhattan and New Jersey. So, um, very great stuff. Um, I only do projects that have that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's new to you, but this is standard operating procedure. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this partnership. Okay. <laughs> very right. um, so that, that's a great segue. I think uh, now we're going to kick it over to uh, Dan Kaplan uh, at, at FX Collaborative to to talk a little more about the design. Great, thanks, thanks, John. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see everybody again. Um, I'm just gonna run through um, the design, sustainability, and organization of the, of the building, and then also talk a little bit about the open space uh, at both at the setbacks and on, on 39th Street. So um, uh, here's the, the building um, we've been, before you before, but just to remind, um, you know, we wanted a design that was um, rooted in um, the neighborhood, the history of the neighborhood um, that avoided the all glass paradigm that we see cropping up. Um, that was really influenced by the setback skyscrapers um, uh, of the West thirties. And, um, uh, and that's really what we adopted. Um, so, uh, Again, um, the building is uh, has two real flavors or skins. One is a sort of limestone colored precast uh, outer shell on both the north and the south tower or the residential and, and, and the you know, hotel tower. And then there's an inner um, uh, warm iron spot brick uh, we call filling, which is more vertically striated. And instead of having two twin towers, we've really use these two flavors to play off each other so that we have a more um, dynamic uh, um, composition. I'll show you a little bit more of that momentarily. Um, the, 
as we showed you before, we've relocated the residential entrance to 40th Street and brings the residential tower right down to the ground and, and is strongly identifiable. Since we last met, the, the vehicular access has been accepted by DOT um, and that the podium has been increased to really in, um, work with all the hotel program, but also the mechanical, the extensive mechanical programs um, that, that uh, really serve a, a tower of this size. Next, sustainability. Uh, uh, we are um, designing this to achieve LEED Gold certification, which is becoming uh, an ever uh, higher bar given the uh, increased performance re-levels of uh, the energy code. Um, also, there's an emphasis on those points in the certification, which uh, are, are New York City centric uh, that, that deal with the 8050 goals that are really about um, the, uh, you know, the, the issues that, that, that really impact us. Um, because of its performance and its uh, energy efficiency, it will be well below the greenhouse gas uh, emissions limit of local law 97. Um, we're looking very closely at zero waste and how we can even use the, the, compo the composting to vis-a-vis -vis the Javits uh, and, and their farm that they're creating. Um, there'll be green roofs, bird safe glass. Um, and I think the big, biggest thing we're doing again is, is getting away from the all glass building and really creating large, nice opaque surfaces where you can heavily insulate and heavily seal. Uh, so next slide. So what does that add up to on the site? Um, the slide on the left, I think, is, is from uh, the most you know, indicative, I guess. Uh, so it's from uh, 40th Street and 10th Avenue looking west. The hotel towers on the left, the residential towers on the right. Uh, you can see the play of the sort of lighter limestone colored precast outer shell and the inner, inner darker um, uh, brick uh, filling sort of weaving its way down. Um, the middle view is 11th Avenue and 43rd Street looking south. So you're looking really at the north face of, of the residences. Uh, and really there you can see how it rises. You know, there's a base, a setback, it rises straight up and then there's it's set back to the west. And finally, um, the view on the right from the park and 40th Street and you know, the residences are on the left and the hotels on the right. And you, again, you could see this play between the two buildings. They're not twin towers, but they are, they're really two buildings in dialogue with each other. Next slide, please. Um, at the base, uh, we showed you this last time, but we've developed it a little further. Um, the, this is the residential uh, base of the building at the corner 40th and 11th. The residential entrance is is at the corner with that with that um, sort of rust colored canopy, really right across from the the crosswalk. Just to the right of that, in in the next two bays, uh, is the is the uh, office entrance, and I'll show you where that's located in the building in a moment. But really, we've taken um, as much of the frontage of 40th Street and activated it with entrances and and eyes on the street, and then the two the three bays that you see on the right are the uh, the police entrances and, and the loading dock entrances as, as far to the west as possible on 40th Street. Uh, on the on 11th Avenue side, as the building turns, you see that um, dark uh, metal and glass um, cube. That's the entrance to the, uh, the grocery store. And if you go to the next slide, it's a view from the opposite corner looking north. Um, this is really now you're on 39th Street looking north. I'll start at that same cube, sort of two thirds of the way up. That's the grocery store. Then you have the three entrances to the, the hotel. Um, in, in this case, we've really created a differentiation between the hotel, which is taller and glassier than the, the residential base, which is more domestic and residential in scale. And then really as you turn to the left or to the left as the building turns down that space that Jonathan was referring to, on 39th Street is the open space, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's, uh, but really, what, there are convenience entrances onto that, but all the main entrances are, are, are obviously on the avenue. Uh, next slide. So building organization, um, this is a real puzzle. Um, uh, 
really, um, this has been a group effort with, um, you know, uh, Guathmi Siegel Kemen and um, uh, Star White House and all the engineers and and so forth. But the the this really gives you. A, I'll go through the part, parts individually. But the orange is the hotel tower to the south with its podium. Uh, the the reddish maroon color is the is the grocery store. It has a sort of two story high entry, and then you come in great and go down. The blue is the offices. The green that's weaving through is the police garage and then the the golden color is is the residential next slide so now i'll walk you through each piece um so and how it is organized it's really a, a rubik's cube but um the this is now the hotel uh, as i said three entrances off of 11th and you'd go up to sky lobbies and and directly up to rooms depending on on which hotel it is and really there's um, an expansion of uh some of the floors at the base go go all the way across for for ballrooms and so forth. Next, then you have the retail, which you go in and go down. There's about half the floor areas at grade and half the floor areas below grade. Next slide uh, is the residential coming off of the corner lobby, package room, mail room, elevators up to the fifth floor and beyond. The fifth floor was that plan. And I'll show you this in a little bit more detail. The fifth floor is a plan um, that was just shown that it has the amenities and they have a uh, accessible roof off of it with um, uh, directly uh, access from the amenities and, and, the, and the, the units above. Next slide. Uh, the, the offices off of 40th Street, a, a modest lobby entered four floors of, of office space at face 40th. And next slide is the police garage. So the police has basically uh, a ramp up to the, the second floor and then uh, it spirals up. So there's three floors all told. And then there's a small at grade, um, three spaces, two or tandem that face on for, for quick, easy, easy on, easy off, so to speak. Next slide is the loading, which really shows um, how the, all the loading is from 40th Street. And then there is service elevators up and down that really service the um, the hotel it goes down to the um, and also the loading also serves directly into the uh, retail space. Uh, the trash room is for the residential is also accessed from this service elevator and is uses the loading dock to stage in um, uh, the, the the garbage. Next. So uh, roof plan uh, at 11th Avenue is to the bottom, 40th to the to right, uh, 39th Street to the left. I'm just gonna start at the upper right-hand corner and sort of recap this so just to show you that it's like we've used every frontage as possible. Um, there's those, the, the, the New York uh, Police Department access ramp, uh, then the loading dock, then the PD parking, then the office residential at the corner, supermarket in the middle, the three hotel entrances. And as I said, I'll get to the open space momentarily. Next slide. Okay, now this is the fifth floor open space and then I'll take you down to the grade level open space. The open space on the left is in the courtyard between the two buildings. It faces onto the Dravitz roof. Um, it's composed of uh, about 60% or 50% green space and the rest is occupied and accessed directly off of the hotel. There's a substantial buffer, green buffer between the occupied space and the residential, which is on the right, that's sort of uh, uh, amorphous shape uh, to the right to really buffer and, and, and keep the, the hotel population to, uh, to the south. Then you have wrapping around on the fifth floor, um, that setback terrace that really um, is directly accessible from the community spaces, from the supportive housing offices, and there's also a terrace directly off of the residential fitness room. So um, next, next slide. I wanted to, next. Uh, so uh, we, we've developed this a little further. This is the uh, easement uh, open space. Uh, we, we show this to you. Um, uh, several months ago, um, and we've uh, taken into account the comments and developed it a little further. Um, this is working with Star White House landscape architects. So really, this is a space that flanks the south side of 
of the bill of the of the project all along the hotel development and really it we think of it as in three three sort of unequal segments starting from right to left the, the right side is really the entrance area then there's really a more social seating area and then as you get further west it gets denser and more bosque like and the the comment and i think it's this is much clearer shown in the next slide please the uh, the, the comment was shown was shared last time was like look we know these have to be movable planters we know this has you know because there has to have emergency access it has to be able to get through the easement but we wanted to create something that was lush enough and really was a welcoming place so actually star white house found these um very large planters they're like 10 by 20 planters that are really designed to be forklift movable and that allows for the depth of planting that you need for trees and for 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 substantial planting and and so forth so um uh we incorporated that um use uh, interspersed movable tables and chairs uh it gets progressively denser as you get further to the west and also incorporated a informational sign uh on the east side where visitors are coming in and out so they can they can understand wh where they're going with that uh i'll turn it over to julie pollock from sam schwartz's office who can walk us through some of the uh streetscape uh and bicycle treatments that are going on thanks dan and good good evening everyone um, so in this slide and the next one, we're going to quickly review some of the existing pedestrian and, and bicycle infrastructure near the project site, um, as well as some plan improvement. So as you can see on this plan, um, some current pedestrian treatment includes um, a leading pedestrian interval or LPI at the intersection of 11th Avenue and 39th Street. So that's number one. There's also a pedestrian only phase at 40th Street, so that's number two, and two pedestrian refuge islands that I think are quite recent on the north and south side of 40th Street, so that's the two number numbers three. Um, in the future, um, with the proposed two-way bike lane that you can see in the middle of 11th Avenue in, in, in green on this plan, um, this will allow for the construction of a new pedestrian refuge island. So the same type of island that you have currently at 40th Street, but on the north side of uh, 39th Street. Um, this new bike lane will also allow for a reduction in turn lanes at 40th Street. So as you can see on this plane, the, the northbound and southbound turn lanes will go from three lanes to two lanes. So this intersection here will experience kind of a road diet. Um, in addition of all these projects that are going to be are supposed to be implemented by DOT, um, the construction of the proposed project will result in completely new sidewalks along uh, 11th Avenue and 40th Avenue in front of the project site, um, new ADA compliant pedestrian ramps on the west side of 11th Avenue at 39th Street and 40th Street, um, and also visual and audible signals um, on the south side of 40th Street, where you can see um, the different curb cuts. Uh, and these signals will help um, inform pedestrians and cyclists that some vehicles can, can, can conflict. Next slide, please. So in terms of bicycle treatment, um, the project site is not adding any um, improvements. Um, but it's worth mentioning that with the new uh, planned um, two-way bike lane in the middle of 11th Avenue, which will also be uh, continued on, on, on West um, 40th Street, as you can see on the plan, um, the existing uh, crosstown bike route, so you have an eastbound and, and westbound bike lane on, on 38th and 39th Street, um, so all of these routes will be connected directly to the Hudson River Waterfront Greenway, which will be a, a great improvement for, for the neighborhood. And now this uh, slide deck uh, presentation is done. So thank you all for listening. And I think we can open up for questions and, and comments. Um, I want to thank everybody. Are we, uh, Dan or, or John, are you finished with your presentation, Lauren? Yes, pretty much so. At, at, at this time, uh, we're done with the uh, presentation. So we welcome any questions and comments from the community board.
All right, there's, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. Uh, I just want to start out with saying one thing to Doug and, and Joe, um, uh, uh, with the support of housing. Um, this is great stuff. We're a very welcoming community, and we want to support uh, the good work you're doing. I, I just want to emphasize one thing. It's important that you also communicate with us, with the community board, with your local precinct. We all need to work together uh, to make... Uh, your, your uh, operation is a success. Uh, I'm gonna open it up. I think Dolores, I'm gonna take you first. And, and I, I see James had his hand up. Dolores, are you there? I am. Um, bravo. This project has taken so long and this project has incorporated so many ideas from the community. Um, and this was the last presentation we had before the pandemic. And at that time, I was impressed by the design itself uh, because I didn't think that uh, it, you could figure out that puzzle, that Rubik's Cube, and you have. Um, so my only comment is bravo. Nice job. Great. Right, I like those Appreciate short comments. Uh, thank you, Dolores. James, did you have uh, your hand up? No? Yes. Uh I'm going to echo uh, Dolores' uh, compliment. It's really impressive and really sets the standard for how a developer should interact and can come out with a project that was maybe even better than originally intended when they listen to the community and find creative ways to find solutions. The, the increase in affordable housing is, is laudable and incredible. I, I have a couple quick questions. Uh, first, uh, do you know what hotel is going in? Uh, is there a flag identified? Uh, we do. Uh, so we have a, uh, an LOI or just a letter of interest with Marriott um, and it, it'll be a three flag hotel. So we, that'll include uh, Marriott Residence Inn, Aloft and AC. Got it. And as far as the entrances and exits. I know you're, you're a block away. You, you know, we really focus on uh, the frontage on the avenue. I'm just wondering, does this affect at all access to the waterfront? I know you're a block away. It's just, it seems like there's a lot of traffic that could be coming in and out, uh, maybe with, uh, including with your loading and unloading. Like, how are you going to tackle some of those, those issues? Well, we've been working with DOT closely on this. Um, DOT's priority is connectivity uh, with their bike lanes, and that includes a new bike lane that stretches around our site um, on 11th Avenue, as, as shown in, in the slides that Julie presented, and also down uh, West 40th Street, uh, which then connects to uh, the waterfront. Because to the south of our site, the Javits stretches a long ways that really down to um, West 34th Street. So West 40th was seen as, as, a, as a corridor uh, to access the waterfront uh, from this location. So we've been um, closely working with DOT regarding street improvements, connectivity, et cetera. Um, there will be uh, foot traffic that's really um, demonstrated around the hotel and uh, that's at the corner of West 39th Street. And we have a wayfinding signage orientation that um, was presented. Access to the waterfront will be a part of that to showcase if, if there's a hotel guest or uh, a community member um, who wants to know with, you know, how to get to the vessel, how to get to the waterfront, how to get to the theater district. Um, they'll know they won't be sort of lingering in the plaza or, or on the street. Um, the street along uh, 11th Avenue, there's, there's no curb cuts. It's a complete pedestrian experience. We con um, concentrated all of our vehicular access on that West 40th area where there's the bus depot already. Um, so, um, and there will be also signaling, et cetera, with, with the um, uh, NYPD parking lot to alert cyclists, pedestrians, of any movement in, in and out of the uh, loading dock and uh, police garage. That's amazing. Last question. You mentioned um, Radson Development's commitment to uh, local hiring and MWBE hiring, which I, I applaud and kudos. I'm just curious, how do you go about uh, making that public and doing outreach in the community? You know, uh, it's great having those, those numbers, but I'm just like, it, 
do you, do you release a report? And, and also, like I said, do you do outreach to, you know, see if some of those jobs can benefit community board four? We do. Um, so it, it's uh, overseen by the city. Um, so that, that participation goal is memorialized within our closing doc, specifically the regulatory agreement, and it's overseen by the city. And what is generally required is that we submit reports every six months uh, regarding our goals, um, who we've spoken to, our outreach, who we've signed contracts with, et cetera. And that way there's, there's checks and balances to see like if, if we happen to be sl- like not uh, behind in reaching our goal, maybe, you know, we work with the city and saying, what, what is our strategy to sort of get back ahead uh, in our hiring process? Um, and the community board plays a big part of this. I mean, generally where we work, we work, you know, in, in the Bronx or South Bronx, East Brooklyn. We know the players already. Um, this is uh, a different bit of an animal working in Midtown. Um, so we will come back to you. We will come back to Community Board 4 um, when we're ready for to, to hire contracts, whether it's electricians, carpenters, um, laborers, et cetera, uh, to let the community know as much as we can um, that jobs are available um, and that we want to hire locally. It, it's, it's, we see that as part of a successful development and construction. Um, so we'll be coming back there. We'll be going through different um, economic development engines. Uh, we will be posting widely uh, and letting the, uh, the broad community know uh, when jobs become available. Thank you again. Uh, it's such a great example of how a developer should interact with a community board. And that consistency of communication over the last few years that I've seen myself, uh, it, it makes me very confident that you will do that going forward. And, and thanks again, John. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I think everybody's very tired. So we've, we're being very nice to the developers. I, I don't think we should continue to do this. Uh, Paul, you had a question. <clears throat> um, hey, everybody, thanks. Um, again, uh, repeating and echoing the bravos, this is great. Um, I compare this to Tetris rather than Rubik's Cube, but however we want to compare it is fine. You've done an amazing job. The last time you were here, I uh, specifically asked about the loading docks and trash removal. I'm very happy to see that you've integrated that to the interior space of your loading docks um, just to layer in a little bit more and make sure that like Amazon, FedEx, uh, laundry for the hotel, all of that, if there's a way to have that all be functional from inside the interior to avoid traffic on the sidewalks. The audible and visual uh, alerts as vehicles enter and exit the garage is a tremendous asset. Thank you. We just had a bad incident at Columbus Circle and we applaud you for adding that into this service. Um, And then because you're so great at meeting all of our demands. I'm gonna add one more (laughs) tiny little request. Um, One of the things that we've started to request for supportive housing complexes is that the um, residents have an outdoor smoking area that is not on the sidewalk in front of the building. Um, So I wonder if the Doug James Terrace could be a smoking terrace. And that's, and again, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, thank you. That's a good good request. Uh, Brian, Brian Weber. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to echo everything the board has been saying thus far. And um, I, I also just want to emphasize, uh, I agree with uh, Paul that that should be the Doug James uh, smoking terrace, maybe just a small area designated for smoking, not the whole terrace, but I think it's a, it's a really good idea. Um, my question is for Dan. Um, I uh, recall at the last presentation, the internal skin of uh, the two towers was going to be a a somewhat of a reddish glazing brick. Um, And now it's moved more uh, towards a grayish, which I applaud. Um, I have to think of um, one building in our neighborhood um, when you're talking about a glazed skin. Well, two buildings or two McGraw Hill buildings. One of course is the green terracotta one on 42nd street. But the other one is uh, 475 uh, 10th Avenue, which was the original McGraw Hill building, which is a white, uh, has a white glazing to it and is really magnificent throughout the day. Um, And your buildings uh, have this great vantage point um, and they will get a lot of sun on them. So I'm just wondering, and I know this seems really superficial in the mix of all this, but uh, I think it's important. 
Uh, have you taken a look at the 475 10th Avenue? You most probably know it well. And um, is that a consideration uh, in terms of tone and direction of tone for the interior skin? So 475 10th uh, is the, just remind me of that one again. Is it, um, oh, that's the uh, terracotta building. Is yeah, it's a, it's a it's a white glazed. Yeah, I, I believe it's terracotta and brick. I think yeah, I think that yeah. Okay, I know the building. Um, Massimo Vignelli was in that building. Yes, right? yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and uh, and then I think Richard Meyer was too, but he's yes he's persona non grata. <laughs> so anyway, they're still the, in the building. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to be super clear, we are um, have we went to the site we brought like, I don't know, 25 different brick pallets. Um, we looked around, we are honing in on a uh, sort of medium, medium dark iron spot brick that's gray, but has a warm under, warm rust undertone. And we think that works really well with the limestone color of the outer skin. Um, what's really nice about the iron spots is that they have a sheen on it, like you point out, Brian, that mm -hmm. it will change in the light. And then the other thing is, th are those, um, uh, that filling uh, is composed of prow shaped piers. So they will take the light differently each side of the pier. Um, so they're like triangles. And when you, mm -hmm. if you cut a plan in it. And so when the light comes across it, you'll get some very nice differential of, of light and dark. So we really are playing up on the sheen in that brick because we think that, especially as the buildings face off each other, that that really needs to be lively and, and nice looking. Um, I don't think it should be the white color, the white bis color of, of, of the Vignelli building and because I think it's it will compete with the outer limestone shell. Mm -hmm. And the McGraw Hill is a beautiful, beautiful building. And we use, we looked at it very carefully for our new building in downtown Brooklyn where we're, we're moving into it. I love that building, but again, I don't think that coloration is really uh, appropriate for this sort of, we really were looking and last time we showed you sort of the warm brown rust, not brown, but but gray rust colors and uh, it seems mm -hmm. to be working. Right. Thank you, Dan. I, thank totally you, agree with you about yeah. Yeah. I, I would just like to say thank you for uh, making uh, affordable housing and supportive housing uh, aesthetically pleasing because most of us only get to appreciate these buildings from the outside and, and uh, it's important to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Good point. Uh, Joe and then uh, Chris LeBron. Joe? Sure. So first, just congratulations on the entire team to surviving to get the certification. Okay. <laughs> That's been persistence beyond belief and we appreciate it. Um, when you hear my comments, you'll be surprised because they're so minimal. Uh, the first one is, um, your, your site map, you need to correct it. It shows Dyer Avenue as a green space and it shows the mid-block Bell Oxide Park going to 42nd Street. That has not existed for about 10 years or so. So if you can please correct it because that will annoy a lot of people in the neighborhood as they look at it. Um, that slide 13 with the numbers of units, John, you really got to get that clearer so it makes it, so it's those 114 are a subset so it doesn't create confusion for the public when you put it out there. Um, I, I make the correct assumption that the community room on the fifth floor is a community room for all the tenants in the building, not just supportive housing tenants, correct? That's correct. I'm sorry. I did not yeah. mention that. It's for all and then, the tenants. And, and then if that's the case, the one change I would make in the design, you need to have the public area, the public lobby go right out onto the deck as opposed to going through the community room. So if you want to close the room, people have access to that terrace. So I think we will make that recommendation. Uh, and the last piece is we spoke at our last discussion about the open space adjacent, not part of the project, but related. And we want to invite you to join a working group. We have been in touch with uh, Empire State Development Corporation, Javits, and the Port Authority. And everyone's willing to come together with the developer and the community board to figure out a way to treat this in total. The bid will also be part of this discussion. So if you want to extend an invitation tonight, then we'll hopefully convene this probably within two weeks or so. We've made a lot of progress on that. Thank you. That, that would be very helpful. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Chris, Chris LeBron. Are you there, Chris? 
There we go. My headphones were in and out and I muted everything. So, so every once in a while I, I was getting like a choppy feedback. I just wanted to talk about the terraces real quick. Um, how high are they? And um, are, are there suicide, anti, you know, suicide pre prevention plans? Uh, if the terraces are going to be made available to everybody there, I want to make sure that we don't have the same problems we've had over at um, the big giant thing in, Hel in, in Hudson Yards. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. We, uh, Dan, do you want to talk or? Go ahead, John. We, we actually addressed that head on. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, it, it's crucial when dealing with a um, at-risk population that we put all the precautions necessary. Um, and we, and it's really uh, kudos to uh, CUCS for, for flagging this. And um, we spoke through with some design uh, elements that we could do where um, we would have um, sort of safety measures for prevention in place, but that wouldn't dominate the space or, or take away the feature extensively. So. Uh, what we are currently planning are on top of the parapet um, where the where the fifth floor terrace is would be eight foot tall um, panels with a, a thin netting uh, coming across it. So something that you would typically see um, on um, on the top of school rooftops. This is often a um, SCA and, and DOE design element that activates um, rooftop for recreational space for children, but you, ha you have these panels or netting. Um, so balls and other items don't fly off the roof, et cetera. So this, uh, this way um, there's protection in place uh, for anyone or anything uh, to come off the terrace, but there's still that, that visual uh, corridor. There's still that, that scenic element uh, that we'll have from the terrace. Thank you. And just a follow up question. I, I didn't intend to have it. I appreciate that, John, very, very much. Um, the, the services being provided, um, will these services be available to those who are, you know, undocumented, but have an ID NYC card and have been suggested by the city to you? Doug or Joe, do you want to take that? We um, use we use what's called a you want to do it, Doug? No, you go ahead. We use what's called a housing first model. So all we require of people is that they, they meet the eligibility requirements. They're formerly homeless, have a mental health problem, and then they have a way to pay their rent. So that, that's it for us. Otherwise, that, that's a simple answer to a convoluted question, and I appreciate that it's that straightforward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there are any more uh, questions. I just want to add one thing uh, to the committee. We have to stop being so nice to the developers. This is not a good precedent. I think uh, that uh, Richard and Lauren uh, and Sean uh, get a lot of credit for uh, dealing with us and guiding this through. Uh, and, and, and Dan, what, I just think that's a beautiful design. I just think it's a terrific design and you must be a puzzle fan. I don't know how you put it together, but it's quite impressive. I think that's just my opinion. Uh, I'm very proud of the uh, And I just want to say one thing to Julie, uh, that 11th Avenue is such, such a heavily and busy uh, thoroughfare. So good for you for thinking uh, of all those mitigation uh, methods. It's rather a hazardous uh, avenue. So the more you can calm it down, the better. I think that's great. Uh, Janine, were there any uh, members of the public that would like to speak? No, I don't see any hands up. Oh, no hands. My goodness. Well, congratulations to you all. What uh, oh, I see- Joe, I, I think on. Joe has I, his I, hand up. I know, but just before that, uh, what's our next step? Uh, do you want a letter from us? Do ah, I see. I'm gonna Joe ask you that question. Yeah. Okay, Joe. Go ahead, Lauren. Lauren. No, please. Joe needs to speak first. He has lots of thoughts. He's on mute though, so I won't let him. We were going to ask you. So, given that we've met many times um, with you, and you know, this is our official Euler hearing. So, what we're asking you for is an official Euler recommendation, and of course, we want you to recommend this wholeheartedly. 
um, with any, you know, things, assertions, thoughts, feedback you have in there. And we look forward to doing that expeditiously, right, so that we can get to the end of this process before the end of this administration. Um, and our next step is Borough President. So, so that's okay. what we hope to have from you as soon as if you pop are, I had a request. Uh, if, I had a request from uh, Dolores first, Joe. Oh, go, 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 go. Make the motion if, if you permit. So Dolores, you were first, go ahead. I'm just making the motion that we approve the requested um, uh, ULERP actions uh, in order to go ahead and continue to move this project forward. I think that we should be highlighting in our letter all of the um, accommodations that have been made by the team uh, for this community concerns as well as to point out uh, some of the above and beyond that we are seeing within this project, including uh, mitigation of traffic issues, et cetera. I mean, there's a laundry list of things to add in the letter, but again, I think it's important for us to lead with the fact that we are, are gaining so much um, affordable housing and that the component of the supportive housing is very thoughtfully um, implemented um, and that we support uh, this project. That's my motion. Without all the second. second, and just would add that we write one of those very full of information in ULERP letters, but importantly, make it clear how much we support the design because the story with PDC is not yet over. We need to support this developer to get through that. We need to do a very full section on design. Thank you. We do have to get, clear that hurdle. <laughs> We will instruct the writing department to make sure that it's a very long letter. I just want to say one thing in conclusion. We should give a round of applause to Joe Restuccia because Joe, when he was a small boy growing up in Newark, he saw that site and he knew one day it would be an affordable housing site. And uh, no, seriously, Joe has... This was a gleam in his eye uh, many years ago, decades ago, and he persisted in, in getting this done. And I have to say 350 affordable units, almost 350, moderate, middle, that's, that's a great accomplishment. So John, round of applause. Thank you. J JD, can we name the smoking lounge after Joe? <laughs> I just want to note, though, to build affordable housing in the city, you have to start in 1988, but yeah. you get it eventually. And that's when the board started with this site. It's friggin' amazing, guys. Thank you so much. So we have a motion. We have a second. Do we have any discussion? If not, all in favor of uh, Dolores' motion, uh, just raise your hand. And anybody opposed? Um, are any present but not eligible, I think the motion carries. So again. Uh, um, JD, sorry, just Richard, to clarify, Chris, uh, Chris, Leslie, and David, I don't have a vote for you. Yes, for David. OK. Chris, Chris. you there? He just said yes. Yeah, OK. okay. Right. Thank you. So Slaughterhouse team, congratulations. Nice job. Thank Bravo. you so much. Thank you. Have a Thank good Thank you, night. everybody. Nice Thank to you see very you. much. I'll appreciate it. Talk to you later. Okay. We nice have a couple. Sorry. Ah, uh, they all left us. We have a couple quick items, uh, if, if we could. Uh, one is uh, there was an, uh, yet again uh, an illegal uh, demolition on 47th Street between the 400 block between uh, 8th and 9th. Uh, Avenue. 300 was, block. 300 block. Sorry, 300 block. It was discovered by the uh, Lock Association president, former board member, Elka Fears. I went out. He, we had to uh, medicate him heavily, and uh, he was so upset. The board is upset. He called DOB. There's a stop work order. Joe, do you know any more about that uh, demolition? Uh, yes. I, I thought that we would, um, first of all, just dust off our old anti-demolition letters that we have at form. Yeah. Um, the, the very disturbing part about this, this was a city-owned building that was sold for affordable housing to four firefighters. Those, there was a 30-year restriction that expired and they sold it. And they sold it to a developer who got a permit from DOB to demolish it 
in illegally from DOB. So it has been stopped and we hope to have a meeting with DOB about it sometime in the next two weeks to deal with the same issue all over again. And really thanks to Elka Fears who just like many of us just was walking by a building and found part of the facade ripped off. And that's how it got stopped. It took about 24 hours, but it was stopped. Joe, I have a question. Yeah. Are we discussing the building next to Ramona Ponte Park on Street? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So can, can I get a little bit more context on that? Because I actually knew former residents that were in there. So you're saying this building was identified and provided as housing for members of the FDNY. No, no, there, there, there was a, a request for proposal. Four members of the FDNY applied for that RFP. They won it. They came to the community board who recommended it. They're purchasing it. They renovated it. They lived there. When the regulatory agreement ran out, they sold it. Then this developer who- Got you. Them, okay, because I actually know people who were not FDNY living that building during that time. I will, I will guarantee you they didn't follow their agreement too much. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, so Thanks. Th th I want to thank Elka and, and, and Joe for your institutional knowledge on this. Um, this is a project that uh, uh, expanded very, very quickly Thanks, and suddenly. So thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Joe. We have one more item. Uh, Bob, we, we are going to get a planning fellow. I think there's a possibility. Uh, Bob, you, you know about this? Yeah, the community board gets a planning fellow every year since 2006 from the borough president's office. You, you didn't get one last year because of the pandemic. So there's, and this one's starting later than usual. The last project that a planner did was on garbage in new developments. She had worked with David on it on from our committee. So one of the suggestions, you have to give a, a couple of things that you would like the planner to do and submit it to the borough president's office. Then they show it to them and they, they choose the things that they like. So one of the things we thought we talked about is doing the next steps that came out of David's project before just to continue on. And then if the committee has any other ideas or suggestions to, to let uh, Jesse know or Janine so they can put it together in, in the package, they have to send out, I believe it's due May 28th, Janine, that's late May. I think Jesse said May 28th. That's it. May 28th, yeah. Chelsea Landis is looking at one as well. Okay. Right, thanks. Uh, David, David, if you're there and you want to follow up on this, you should talk to Jesse. But, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I did, I did, I am, I w I'm glad to hear Bob make that suggestion because, you know, we had this report which is now sort of gathering dust, um, uh, but there's been no, no push to actually, you know, implement changes in the, in the, um, you know, in the building code that would, that would incorporate, that would require the incorporation of these kinds of trash issues into new development. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's the critical step. Um, and that's, you know, it's going to be a lot of work. So, uh, be fantastic if there was an intern who could, who could, um, you know, could help with that. Yeah, we thought okay. that would be good. And even though it's not going anywhere now, that's you know, on June 22nd, you're going to know who the next mayor is. So in, in that case, having new ideas might be useful. Particularly group. if it's the sanitary, the ex, uh, the former San sanitation and, commission. And David. <laughs> yeah. Catherine Garcia. I know her. She's yeah. a nice one. I don't know about mayor, yeah. but she's a nice one. Thank you, Bob and David. Follow follow up on that if you want with uh, Jesse. That would be great. Uh, there was there's another important item, uh, uh, Joe. You want to talk about uh, the possibility in the larger federal government about some program to reunite communities that were torn asunder at one point, and how we might uh, start uh, getting involved with this with a letter. Uh, in case there is a program that's developed by the federal government. So uh, in the, the Port Authority Working Group of the board met with the port today and discussed a spe specific aspect of the proposed infrastructure bill that's called Connecting Communities. And it's specifically about repairing parts of cities that have had highways driven through them, such as Dyer Avenue in our case for the Lincoln Tunnel. 
the bill is just currently out there. It's not settled yet, as the infrastructure bill we learned today is going to be settled sometime through the summer into the fall. But the concern was that we voice our request that the dire revenue approaches be considered eligible as part of this future bill, because that will enable, as the Port Authority builds the bus terminal and deals with the issues down to 38, down 37th Street, everything south could be looked at and how it could be developed to open space or other community type uses. So we recommend that we do a short letter noting to our elected officials, in this case, Chuck Schumer, Kristen Gillibrand, uh, and uh, Nadler, that we would like to see this as a possible source of funding for our redevelopment of our community in a way that is very much serving the point of this bill to cover up the scars of highway construction in the middle of cities. Uh, yeah, uh, Dolores. Um, Dolores? Yeah, while I recognize that this is an opportunity for funding, I do believe that the spirit of, of this uh, law is about urban renewal. And urban renewal certainly uh, impacted many more communities uh, in a much um, a more profound way than our own. So uh, personally, I'm a little concerned to, um, uh, to bring those dollars into a community which has other solutions, private developers, um, et cetera, which can help on this issue when those, those funds could really be repairing, let's say the Bronx. Uh, if we want to talk about our city or other parts of the country. I, and that's just my personal opinion. I just wanted to make that statement um, because I, I don't think that the intent was to bring those funds to a, a generally wealthy city uh, that hasn't had the same impact, hasn't had the same uh, detrimental impact from urban renewal as other communities across our country. We lost 350 buildings full of people who live there for the construction of Dyer Avenue. And I believe that in general, we seek always to balance broader national needs with our community because we sit and we represent our community first and foremost. Um, so I don't think that the idea or the intent of this bill is limited to any specific group. I did some reading today on it and it's pretty broad about cities and it is clear that poor people were the ones who were most affected by these infrastructure projects. And our community, as long as a poor, very poor community at that point, that was wiped out. So I think it's an appropriate request. We may not see a penny of it, but at least we should make sure we're not excluded from its use. JD, if I may. Uh, uh, Chris, yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, Considering both Dolores and Joe's responses, uh, while the Puerto Rican and Black Congressional Caucus in New York are fighting to um, undo the work of Robert Moses, um, I, I, I do, and I think it's incredibly important that we look at the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Bell Parkway and the BQE as scars in our in our city's map. Um, so so is Dyer Avenue. Um, and I, 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 if we don't get a dollar, that's fine. Uh, but we should at least um, be on the record in acknowledging that poor urban planning, um, or rather malicious urban planning directed towards uprooting our working poor at that time, our working class and our middle class um, had a detrimental effect on House Kitchen. I, I would second uh, a letter to those elected officials uh, in that spirit. Uh, thank you, Chris. Can... Thank you, Chris. Uh, I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time on this. Go ahead, okay. Brian. No, I just want to echo uh, what I'm Joe. Uh, 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 hello, uh, am I muted? Oh, I'm on. Okay. I just want to echo what Joe said, and I also want to echo what Chris said, and I also just want to remind everyone that, you know, um, the Hell's Kitchen South Coalition. Uh, which brought together uh, hundreds of community stakeholders. The thing that was most important to our community was improving the air quality, improving pedestrian access east and west through the neighborhood. And we identified as uh, covering the scar of Dyer Avenue 
as a means of getting there. So I know that it's something that's immediate and important to the community. We're, we're looking at other means to do that through you know, the Port Authority's uh, work on the bus terminal, but um, I, I just really, I think the letter's important. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I just want to say, I think Dolores raises a, a, a terrific, we were told that uh, yes, uh, uh, fixing up Dyer Avenue uh, platforming was uh, a reasonable request and stood a chance. So I, my feeling is we may not get anything, but it's incumbent on us to at least apply to say, yes, there were scars. Um, hundreds of people were thrown out. Uh, and thousands. if there are thousands, thousands of people were, I mean, hundreds of apartments, uh, buildings, thousands of people. And uh, the competition, if there are more worthy projects, that's for the Congress to decide. Yes, but I think we should throw our hand in um, just in case. So I think that's enough discussion. All in favor of, of writing a letter um, and uh, any opposed? One, one, one opposed? Are you opposed, Dolores? Um, that's a no. I kind of lost you there. She said no. It's a no, not. Dolores? No, she I, I, okay. I voted in favor. I voted, in, voted favor. in favor of the letter. Thank you. Uh, thank you it's so unanimous. much. Look, it's unanimous. Thank you. Before we leave, use there, the was word a, no. there was a question from Barbara Blair. I don't know if Barbara, are you still with us? Uh, Barbara says maybe the planner can extend the 40th Street Plaza next to the thank new you. affordable housing development over past the floor. No, I just turned over past the Port Authority and yeah. Oh, Bob there you are. Hi, hi. Bob was uh, mentioning the possibility of an intern uh, for planning, so I was just putting a little seed in there that since the affordable housing uh, and supportive housing um, building is going up, and you're going to have that beautiful 40th Street Plaza, which is closed. There's not a pedestrian corridor that's been created that brings the folks from Javits into the central business district. And if you start with 40th Street and you go across the Port Authority, and I gather you have a group already working on the Port Authority in Penn, but if there was some cohesive connection between Javits and sort of Midtown West along 40th Street, since you already have a start. And that, that it's not a question, it's just a, wow, wouldn't it be great to have someone look at that? Yeah, it's an excellent, it's an excellent idea. Bring it to uh, transportation, perhaps, Paul. I mean, having some kind of uh, nice street to. That's what the Highline. That's what the Highline wants to do by connecting to Javits and then going off into Brookfield and out into Penn Station. Down on 30. It looks like part of our Port Authority work, JD, might may, may jive into that, where yeah. we're talking about the entrances and stuff with the intercity terminal. Am I it? Barbara, we should talk offline. We're actually having discussions. Yeah, about. I'd love to, because I gather you have a committee that's looking yeah. at that kind of thing. Okay, terrific. Thanks. Bon nuit. Yeah. Thank you, Bon nuit. This has been, let's just keep going. <laughs> Somebody can make a motion. No, motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. All in favor. Aye, aye, aye. Aye, aye, aye. Thank everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you, Janine. Thanks, Janine. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. Good night, Thank you, Janine. Good night, everyone. Thank you. You're